Hello and welcome everyone to a very special edition of the Sunday Show. Tonight we're looking at the Ottoman Generals World War I and tier ranking them. Joining me tonight is Sean Chick back from Mardi Gras. Both of us feel under the weather, but we will persevere. Unlike the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so Sean, how's it going, man? Uh, yeah, I pretty much got what I guess you would call a uh, post Mardi Gras cold. A lot of people have that right now. Um, you know, so that's pretty much really about it. I'm kind of under. The, I'm pretty under the weather, and I'm working all the time right now because lots of guides are out and sick. Guides are either sick or out of town, or they quit. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a lot of work right now. Yeah, and um, I did not get to enjoy any Mardi Gras festivities, and I still ended up with a I guess post Mardi Gras cold. I tested negative for COVID, <laughs> so I guess that's what it must be. So I just guess I just got fucked. Yeah. I didn't get to drink anything or do anything fun. I just got sick, so that that's great. Oh yeah, that's always that's always fun. So yeah, no, that's pretty much what we got going on over here. Uh, I guess it's going around the uh, whatever it is that people are catching right now, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. My girlfriend's been sick too since Thursday. Both of us have been. Kind of, uh, eh. But, oh, yeah. yeah, I think I'm, I mean, I don't want to knock on wood. I thought I was better yesterday until I got really late, and then I felt like crap most of the day until I took some medicine. Medicine, in theory, is worn off, so hopefully I'm recovered. But then again, maybe it's just not that late yet. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. So if I start sounding sniffly and shitty as this goes on, well, you know, uh, I guess we'll just have to suffer together because I once I start doing this I'm gonna finish okay so gotcha. the Ottomans and World War one the final war of one of the longest lasting empires in history I don't want to give a full introduction to this topic we've talked about this in the past with our series on or in our series but our stream on the factions of World War one so what I will say or just a few preliminary remarks to help to guide this. So first of all, when it came to doing research for this one, it's very hard to get into depth on the Ottoman generals unless you know Turkish, and unfortunately, I do not. So a lot of what I have on the non-major figures, there are seven people we'll look at of the 21 about whom there's plenty to say, and then there are about 14 <coughs> others who are army commanders, but what I can tell you is limited just based on what I was able to find. Keep that in mind. Um, what I can say in terms of general strokes for this... Get into depth on the Ottoman general. Oh, um, yeah, so anyway, what I can say in the more general strokes is that the Armenian genocide fits in with the overall... Uh, what's going on with your mic? Hmm? What's going Everything's on? okay on my end. Okay. I'm hearing a lot of... Uh, you hear me fine? Yeah, I can, I can hear you, but your mic's making a lot of noise. Okay, there, there now it's good. Alright, um, so... Okay. When it comes to the Ottoman Empire, we have to keep in mind a few things. One is that... While there still was a sultan, the last sultan of consequence was Abdul Hamid II. He had been deposed in 1909, and although he uh, was seen as sort of a conservative faction leader, in a way he actually was a reformer as well. So the Ottomans have been feverishly trying to reform for decades. And in fact, if we look at just the tech level of their troops, they're relatively on par. Uh, maybe not as equipped to say... A Western European army, but they're not as poorly equipped as one would think. Um, in terms of their tactics and training and the officer training, they're not that bad either. At least at the upper echelons, because a lot of their senior officers go to Germany to study. Germany has been training the Ottomans for some time, and in fact will meet the most popular German instructor ever, who uh, the Ottomans absolutely adored. And then in 1909, or 1908, excuse me, the Young Turks took over. And the Young Turks, also known as the CUP, or Committee of Union and Progress, 
were, as the name implies, rather young, and by the standards of their time, they were considered progressive. They wanted to move the Ottoman Empire forward, they wanted to modernize, they had a lot of new ideas. So, um, that group will be firmly in power by the time the war starts, so I won't bother looking at the Sultan who ruled at the time, Mehmed VI. He was not a complete moron or anything like that, but he had no real power, so there's no reason to talk about him. Um, we'll therefore be talking about the three triumvirs. Um, and one thing you'll notice before we get into any of these guys is that if you look at the date of birth, it's very rare to see anyone above 45 years old in command of an army in the Ottoman Empire unless they're German. Uh, most of these generals mm. that we'll cover were between 35 and 45, and one of them who was the younger brother of Enver Pasha, was, I think, a little bit under 30. I think he was about 29 as an army commander. So this is by far the youngest faction that we will encounter for World War One. It's not close. Um, ethnically, the Empire, of course, has the Turks in the driver's seat, but uh, it's <laughs> was much more diverse than that. Of course, there's a huge Arab population, or there's the Armenian population, the Syrians... Um, a bunch of others, but it looks like despite the uh, Arab revolts that ultimately toppled a lot of uh, the Ottoman power in the Middle East, the empire was relatively stable, ethnically speaking, comparatively, uh, and, um, and only when the pressure of war builds, and also when the Ottomans really shoot themselves in the foot through the Armenian Genocide, do these tensions really boil over. Um, as we'll see, the Armenian Genocide was engineered in order to play to the prejudice of what they thought was the Muslim majority, and to try to build unity around an Ottoman identity. So actually, the leaders of the Ottoman Empire were fully aware the Armenians had done nothing wrong, and they were trying to scapegoat them in order to build public support. But because of the way they executed the genocide, meaning when they marched the Armenians all over the empire in order to wear them down, kind of trail a tear style... They ended up fucking up all of their local economies, demoralizing the army completely, and convincing all the ethnic minorities that the Ottoman Empire was no longer a tolerant or safe place for them to live in. So the Armenian Genocide is absolutely central to the story of the Ottomans in World War I. And I think there's an argument to be made that if they had not gone that route, they actually would have had a much, much better chance of surviving the war. Um... It, it cannot be understated the extent to which the Armenian Genocide fucked over the Ottoman Empire's ability to wage war. Logistically and, and in terms of morale, like I said, it was worse than any single battlefield defeat that they suffered in the conflict. And they decided to really go double down on it at a moment when they had a breathing space because they had defeated the British in two major campaigns. But then they completely destroyed themselves and the British came back and yeah, their empire was gone. So, that's sort of the outline of the war. Alright, uh, do you have any general comments or anything about the <laughs> Ottomans? Uh, no, no, this, um, you know, like many people, this is a theater of the war that I don't know terribly much about. Um, what I do know about usually involves T.E. Lawrence and Gallipoli, which is what most people in our position know about. But I do know generally about uh, you know some of the battles and campaigns, um, such as the uh, Caucasus Front and uh, you know, the uh, disastrous autumn off autumn offensive launch there, uh, the great victory at Baghdad. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that about them uh, going on the offensive instead of consolidating. Mustafa Kemal, that's what he advised them to do. Was after uh, 1916 was not to go on the offensive. Um. But you mentioned the Sultan. What did you say, Mehmed the Sixth? Uh, yes, he was the was brother of Abdul Hamid Mehmed the Sixth, and um... he ha he has to have some influence because after Kemal had a big falling out with the Turkish high command, Mehmed the Sixth, the one who brings him back. Yeah. So he has to have some kind of influence. Well, I'm not sure uh, what though. I... That's late in the yeah. war after the triumvirate has pretty much collapsed. Um, because okay, yeah, so he, he does he, retain a lot of prestige, and he does he is he's a middle aged man by this point, uh, so he's not like a kid or anything. He knows what he wants. 
Um, so yeah, once he's able to reassert himself in the Osmanli dynasty, he will have some influence, but it's very late yeah. and limited. Okay, all right, yeah, but... Yeah, this this one, um, given my lack of knowledge on this one, except with uh, some things involving Kamal and maybe Enver Pasha, and dude just being ill and then having work in the morning, I don't know if I'll be able to go the whole way with you. But right. I'm going to go as long as I can. So what we'll do because of that, um, we'll cover the three triumvirs of the Ottoman Empire, the three men who led the Young Turks and therefore the Ottoman government throughout the war, despite many failures, they were able to hang on to power until 1918. We'll cover them. Then we'll skip to Kamal, who I think was 17th on my list. And then maybe we'll do the Germans and then go back to the other Ottomans from there. So that way we have a chance of covering the people that you probably have a more familiarity with before you have to bounce. Does that sound good? Yeah, those would definitely be the ones I know. Yeah, I know a bit about the Tromverin and the... Um... German commanders such as uh, um, Lyman von Sanders and Falkenhayn. He's on here, right? Uh, Falkenhayn didn't make the cut because uh, we'll talk about him when we do the Germans. Uh, but yes, he is actually an Ottoman commander uh, of a major army, the Yildrum Army Group. That was after his term as <clears throat> chief of staff. Okay. He, yeah. We well, he had conquered Romania. Yeah, he had a lot of different commands. Um, Actually, Falkenhayn probably has the most interesting career <laughs> of any German general mm -hmm. in the war, at least in my opinion. Yes, uh, and very controversial. But anyways, uh, go ahead and take it away, sir. All right, so we will begin with the man who, at one point in his career, wanted people to think of him as the Ottoman Napoleon. And that man is Enver Pasha. He was born in 1881 in Istanbul. He was known for being dashing, charismatic, and he was one of the chief organizers of the Young Turks. During the 1908 revolution, he was the figurehead, and so once he took over, he would become the commander-in-chief of the Ottoman army, despite being, I think, a major at the time. And he also was um, one of the three men who would decide all of the policy when they'd have secret meetings. Now, originally, they weren't sure what to do when it came to redirecting the empire because the Young Turks came in understanding that the empire was in dire trouble. It didn't really have a clear vision anymore. Uh, Enver Pasha's initial instinct was to try what he called Pan-Turkism, which was trying to unite all of the people who were vaguely Turkish into one people group, so trying to create a unity all the way out to the borders of China. Of course, that never happened, but it was not a dream that he ever gave up on. Um, there also was the idea of um, really building on their Islamic <coughs> heritage, which was controversial among the Young Turks, because actually most of them privately were atheists, and they feared unleashing holy war because they didn't know if they could control it. At the same time, as we <coughs> see later, part of the reason for going after the Armenians was precisely to play up Islamic identity. So they tried various things to try to keep themselves afloat over time. Now, when it comes to... Um, let's get... Okay, so uh, also, he was one of the so-called savior officers uh, who came to power. That's what they called themselves. Um, he and his colleagues got a lot of opposition from Abdul Hamid II. When they initially came into power, it was on the grounds that he had not followed the liberal constitution established in the 1870s. He still had no intention of doing so. And so they deposed him for his brother, the aforementioned Mehmed VI. That was a project by Enver, and after that, he's really in control. Because he, made, he unmade a sitting sultan and replaced him, which is something that pretty much no one had ever done before. So Enver Pasha was the man. And a lot of people believed his claims that he was this great genius, that he had done all these things at a young age, and that he uh, was really going places, and he was taking the empire with him. Um, during the war with Italy that we discussed on our Italian general stream, he actually went there to become the commander-in-chief, and he had 20,000 men. He did a good job defending the interior, and he did a good job of recruiting local Bedouins and Arabs to help out. 
because Enver Pasha was, as I mentioned earlier, very charismatic. But ultimately, of course, the Ottomans did not win the war, and he was forced to withdraw and cede a good deal of Libya. This was something that would rankle with him for a while, and when we, when we eventually cover his half-brother, we'll see that um, he never gave up on the dream of holding Libya and reclaiming it. While he was in Libya, this is where he first met Mustafa Kemal, or at least when they first really got to work together, the future Ataturk, and they developed a very contentious relationship. And part of this might be over military philosophy, because Ataturk was pretty friendly with the German advisors, whereas Enver Pasha was not. So he tolerated them, and he would even make some of them army commanders as the war went on, but for the most part, he was actually distrustful of the Germans. Um, you know, a part of it is because he, uh, he assumes he's a military genius, so what does he need these damn Germans for? I mean, think about it. Um, so, uh, Enver Pasha, in 1914, he becomes officially the Minister of War and Chief of Staff of the Army. And to really solidify his position, he also married an Ottoman princess and thus gained a rank at court of Damat, which means imperial in-law. So he could address the sultan as his brother. When the war was brewing, the Ottomans were not part of that alliance of net that network of alliances that would necessarily force him to fight. So Enver Pasha was fighting an uphill battle with most of the other CUP leaders, trying to really push to get the Ottomans involved. Ultimately, of course, he got his way, and that's partly because he and the other huge player, Talat Pasha, pushed really hard to make that happen. And I should say, uh, I forgot to say this earlier, but Ta uh, Pasha is sort of an honorific rank that was used in this period, and it I think it translates to something like Prince, which isn't very accurate, but it basically just means a distinguished gentleman of high rank, someone who has standing in the world. And there are other ranks. Bey is basically the same as Pasha, but at a lower level. Uh, some of the people will look at, they started out as Bey, but rose to Pasha as the war went on. I'm not going to point that out, though. And uh, some of them lived long enough that they were alive in Turkey when people actually took up surnames for the first time. Um, there's also the, the rank of Effendi, which I think actually still exists. But that one's more... It, 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 sort of like Esquire, it, it indicates that you're an educated person. Anyway, um, just so you, in case you guys had any questions about the titles. So, um, initially, Enver Pasha was flirting with the Entente, because again, he's not pro-German, and in fact, if anything, he was pro-French. But all the other members of the CUP, most of them were trained by German instructors, and they feel that Germany is the best ally the Ottomans have had. But Enver really wants to keep his options open, and he realizes that the British and French can hurt him much more directly. But so ultimately, uh, his opponents in the government prevail, but he does get his way in terms of entering the war, and the Ottomans join the Central Powers. And when I say that they join it, uh, they actually, despite consulting their other CUP members early, they make the decision, Enver and Talat, on their own. So rather than going back to them and saying, we think this is what we're going to do, they just announced it. Oh yeah, by the way, we're now at war and we're a member of the Central Powers. So let's mobilize and get out there and fight the Russians and the British and get some quick victories. So, um, when the war began, he wanted to resolve things early, and as commander-in-chief, he assigned all the major commanders to their post, and that was something he would continue to do throughout the war. So anytime we talk about somebody getting reassigned, or replaced, or fired, it's all in Verpasha doing it. And this is something he can do with, by himself without any oversight. So in this way, he's a lot like Cadorna. He decides eventually to take personal command against the Russians in the Caucasus, although initially he did not want to do this. But the reason he does it is because he told his plan of advance to the local commander, who we'll get to, 
and the guy basically said it was a stupid plan, Zenver Pasha said, well, you're just a pussy. I'm going to show you how it's done. So he will fight there. He sends another general to fight and try to seize the Suez Canal from the British. And I think there's another operation elsewhere. So Enver Pasha decides in December of 1914 to march into the Caucasus, into the mountains, to attack the Russians. And attack them at near the city of Sarakamish, which was a major Russian base. And he thought he would achieve surprise, overwhelm them, and win a great victory. But in reality, what happened is the Ottomans were not prepared for the cold, their army was basically torn apart by the weather before they made contact with the Russians. The Russians counterattack, and it's one of the worst disasters of the entire war. Um, the estimates, modern estimates, are that he lost, if he, if he advanced with like 120,000 men, he lost, killed, wounded, captured, or incapacitated about 110,000 total. So this was an unqualified disaster. And by the numbers, if you look at the campaign as a whole, this is like Kenai level stuff, uh, but just spread out over a couple months. And you might think at that point that Enver would uh, step down as chief of staff of the army, because this is a huge fuck up. But instead, he decided that it, he met with Talat, and they decided that this was a good opportunity to cast the blame elsewhere. And that's actually when the government started to really pump out anti-Armenian propaganda. So there were Armenians in the army, and they blamed them for the disaster. They said that they had given information to their fellow Orthodox Christians, the Russians. So in many ways, the onset of the Armenian genocide in early 1915 is due to the leader of the country being a military moron. And trying to save his own ass. Well, um, there was also the warship incident when the war started, where um, to get the to get uh, the basically to force their way into the alliance, they accepted some German ships into their harbor that were being pursued by either the British or the Russians. That was an Enver Pasha decision that he didn't consult anybody on. Um, oh, here's a fun irony of him blaming the Armenians for Sarah Kamish. So actually, he was in danger as well, because he's a lead-from-the-front kind of guy. And he would have died or, been ca or gotten captured if not for a soldier who rescued him, and that soldier happened to be Armenian. The guy literally carried his ass out. So, yeah. <laughs> Enver Pasha is a great guy who knows how to show gratitude. Um, when the Allies, the British mostly, began to attack the Dardanelles in March of 1915, uh, Enver's confidence in himself was actually a little shattered, so rather than taking personal command, he allowed the German Lyman von Sanders to take command, even though he did not like him, and then he went on an inspection tour of the East. So... Uh, Enver's self-confidence was pretty badly battered by his Caucasus campaign. Um, he went out to, ass to assess von Falkenhayn's Yildrum Army Group late in the war, 1917 or so, and by that point he had become so unpopular after his defeats, some of his command decisions, and basically being inaccessible, being a poor communicator... Um, the Armenian genocide, other things that pissed people off, that he actually had to avoid assassins wherever he traveled within his own territory. So Enver Pasha became deeply hated, um, had enemies all over. His last major initiative as the chief of staff was to form what was called the Army of Islam, which was all Ottoman, so no German officers anywhere. He placed his stepbrother in charge of it, and this army actually did successfully conquer Azerbaijan in September of 1918. That was like the last great Ottoman victory. And that actually was an Enver Pasha idea. So that's basically the only idea he had in the war that worked. All the other ideas were flaming failures. And we'll cover them 
as we discuss these various officers, because the Enver Pasha hit list keeps going on and on and on. But th he did do one thing that worked, so there's that. Um, let's see. So, after the war, he has an interesting adventure. So, obviously, he's wanted for the Armenian Genocide. The British tried to round up a lot of the guys responsible. He fled to Germany, just like many of the other senior leaders. And then he never uh, met up with the British. He actually fled to Lenin. And so Enver Pasha actually flirted with becoming a Bolshevik at one time. But then he decided to switch sides when he got to the... Uh, wherever it was in South Russia where there were people he could relate to ethnically. And instead he decided to try to become a local ruler for that group. Um, and tried to go his own way and got defeated by the Bolsheviks eventually. Uh, he also tried to return to Turkey during the War of Independence. So, I mean, it just takes a while before he eventually gets assassinated by some Armenians while failing to lead a new republic he's trying to create. But when he tries to return to Turkey, by this point, the leader is Kemal Mustafa. And they hate each other, so so basically the future Ataturk told him to go fuck himself. And refused to allow anyone to let him in. So that's why he never returned home and died in exile on August 4th, 1922. When his uh, little following was destroyed by some Armenians looking to get revenge. <coughs> so what do you think about uh, Enver Pasha, the, the Turkish Napoleon? Well, I mean, not Napoleon. <laughs> um, one thing is that I wanted to say real quick, I read the opposite, that Ataturk, or Kamal, I'm going to call him Kamal, since he's not Ataturk yet, that um, Kamal did not actually like the Germans, is what I've read. Oh. I was very critical of them. What I think might be the case, though, is he may have admired certain German military techniques, but he was not a fan of German military advisors. At least by the time the First World War starts. That's just what I read. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, one thing that's interesting is that at the same time Enver Pasha is launching an army into the mountains in December 1914, so is Konrad von Hotzendorf with the Austro-Hungarians. Yeah. Which is another commander who, like, Luigi Cadorna has almost full control of the military. And it's kind of interesting to note that, too, with the Central Powers. Um, and, you know, in Italy, of course, I mean, not, yeah, I'm sorry, Italy's not in the Central Powers room as well, is that they essentially have, like, semi-military dictators. Like, there's an entire argument that uh, by 1917, Germany is a military dictatorship. Under Ludendorff. Um, yeah, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, uh, the degree of that, I'd like to look into some more, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, somebody like uh, Inver Pasha, Hotzendorf, and Cadorna were all given uh, blank checks in a lot of ways. And one thing that interests me as well is that Inver Pasha also did the whole like Czar Nicholas the thing, right? Where I'm like, I'm going to take over personally. Yeah, that'll. Yeah, you know, like when a guy does that, you can tell they have a high opinion of themselves. Well, to be fair though, um, you know, like I said, he had commanded in Libya. And then he had been yeah. back in time to oversee the Second Balkan War. I guess I forgot to mention that, which the Ottomans were on the winning side of. So he actually did have a track record of success up to that point. Mm. And uh, he also had been a fairly good student. He wasn't number one in his class, but I think he finished fourth in staff college or something like that. So, I mean, it was like, it was like yes. completely ridiculous that he thought that he was good. He just really overestimated himself. Well, he, he, he probably, um, he may have, I mean, not being an Inver Pasha expert, but it sounds like he may have done a classic military thing where you're obviously talented, and you read about somebody pulling off like a brilliant winter campaign. You think, why can't I do that? Right? Yeah. You know, without considering, like, everything that goes into that, the, the Turkish military had made considerable improvements by 1914, but it's still... Not a top-notch military. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, and that's partly why I was more so generous with my rankings of a lot of these guys than I normally would be, because they are leading armies that mostly don't have the greatest morale and are not as well-equipped as, say, the Russians or the British. 
Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> so I think in the case of Kamal, he might have thought he could pull off like a brilliant victory that would have stunned the enemy. And of course, that didn't come to pass. Um, so I don't know. He kind of sounds like an E to me because he had some success later in the war. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Um, uh, but I can make a case for an F. I mean, he does oversee one of the most disastrous offensives of all of the First World War. I mean, to me, I, I have him as an F. I mean, he, I would say this, he's an F. He, right. does, he does have abilities, but if you look at his performance, his performance is awful. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not really going to argue the point. All right, I mean, I'm going to go with F for him. I, hey. I, I think under different circumstances, he could have actually been not terrible, but when you give someone like that complete control, it won't go too well. That's, that's why I find it funny that I guess there are probably still military people who really believe in trying to limit <laughs> civilian oversight to increase efficiency. But if you look at, like we were talking about, the World War I unhindered commanders-in-chief, they all were fucking failures. And not just a little bit. They all were terrible. Um, yeah, L L Lutendorf um, uh, does very poorly in 1918 with what were called the peace offensives. And he's probably the best of this group that we're talking about. I would say easily the best of that group. And I don't, I don't have a very high opinion of Ludendorff, but he's still easily the best of that group. I think I think Lutendorff is really one of your most erratic commanders of the First World War. So it's nice to Falkenhayn. He's very erratic as well. He has brilliant moments, and he has moments where I'm like, are you, are you stupid? Like, okay. what's wrong with you? I haven't done all my research on the Germans yet, or anywhere close to it, but hot take so far, I think Falkenhayn was a better commander-in-chief than Ludendorff. That case can be made. Um, I, don't, I don't honestly think the Germans had a good commander-in-chief during the First World War. Yeah, apparently, um, too, part of the problem that Falkenhayn had is that he was the Kaiser's guy. And so a lot of the other generals felt like he had leapfrogged them, and so they were resentful. Yes, he had problems with that. Um, I, I I have a big problem with Verdun. Uh, it's just it is. I mean, I, I it, to me it seems very. I mean, I know we're, we're going off on Germans right now, but it just seems that with Verdun, um, you know, like there's. Um, like, I'm going back to a board game on this one. There's a game called When Eagles Fight, which is First World War on the Eastern Front. It's a great game. But at a certain point, Verdun happens, and the Germans go from just beating up the Russians to on the defensive. And I'm probably thinking about it, you know, the Russians are the ones doing poorly. That's really where you should be throwing your stuff at, you know, while you hold out in the West defensively. But anyways, yeah. we'll, we'll save that for Germany, I guess. I do know that... Because I may not be here the whole time, I did see a super chat from Nerve and V-Maker that directed at what I can answer if you want me to go ahead and answer it. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So Nerve and V-Maker, $5. Thank you very much. Very happy to see you. Asked about what's a good book on the Mexican-American War? Uh, this is funny you mention this. I've only ever read two books on the war, but both are ones I'd recommend. And I'm going to mention a third book that I'm actually going to be reading uh, this month. So one of them is So Far From God, which was written by John S.D. Eisenhower. It's a readable military history of the Mexican-American War. Um, it's particularly good about Taylor's campaigns. And so I'd recommend that one. Uh, there's also with Beauregard in Mexico. So it's PGT Beauregard's memoirs of the Mexican War, which he wrote before the Civil War. So he wrote it when he still had a fresh memory of these events. It's one of the best primary sources we have for the Amer for, for Winfield Scott's campaign, especially for the for um, uh, high-level high stuff because he's a member of Scott's staff and played a crucial role in several victories, in particular Chapultepec. And the one I'm going to be reading is A Gallant Little Army, which is all about Scott's move on Mexico. Mexico City. And I'm reading that one in conjunction with Beauregard's uh, reminisces <coughs> to write an essay for a. There's an. I got. They asked me to do an essay in a book collection on the experiences of future Civil War generals in Mexico. 
So they asked me if I do Beauregard. And I'll be um, reading the Gallant Little Army while also reading Beauregard's memoirs again to uh, to write the essay. So those are some books that I can recommend on it. Sadly, there's not as much as there should be on this conflict. Uh, but I'd say if you want to go in the military aspects, so far from God is a good way to start. I say military aspect. There's some political stuff in there too, but it's it's mostly a military history. All right. Um, we have another one real fast. Uh, Anthony Mason, $2. He said, will Russia continue to abide by the Montreux Convention? Do you know what that is? Because I don't. I do not either. Yeah, I'm sorry, Anthony. We're not sure what that is. Um, but, uh, I mean, so far it does appear that the Russians have not been super egregious when it comes to shelling civilians. I mean, clearly there are videos of it happening. But it seems to be more incidental rather than purposeful. But as frustration mounts, there's a good chance it'll get worse. So, that'd be my thought on it. <coughs> yeah, it would appear to me... I mean, I have no brilliant takes here. Just It appears to me that, you know, contrast this with American America. When we invade a country like, say, Iraq, we just blow everything up. Because we don't care. We're just going to rebuild it and get contractors have some contracts to get very rich. It appears to me that Russia is trying to preserve as much Ukrainian infrastructure as possible. Which, interestingly enough, is something they did in uh, the Vistula Oder Offensive in 1945. Uh, Stalin had standing orders that the Silesian factory center was not to be blown up. So what the Russians actually did was partially surround it, give the German 17th Army an escape route, which they used, and then they seized it without having to, like, you know, use katushkas on it or anything. So, um, the Russians are not unknown to do something like this. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> next up we have the second member of the Ottoman Triumvirate. His name is Mehmed Talat Pasha. Um, ah. He arguably was actually more powerful than Enver Pasha, although he did not really do nearly as much with the armies and with foreign policy. He was the Minister of the Interior, and this meant effectively that he was the head of the bureaucracy. So anytime Enver Pasha made decisions, Talat would be the guy figuring out how to get people where they needed to be. And apparently, for the most part, he was considered to be pretty good at administration. So that means, of course, he also was one of these guys who was um, with the CUP from the very beginning. He was born in European Ottoman territory at uh, the city that the Turks now call Edirne. It was known as Adrianople before that in 1874. And he grew up as someone who was very critical of the autocracy of Abdul Hamid II. That's what got him into politics. So he became, ultimately, uh, the backer, uh, part of a an autocratic government. So, kind of an odd destiny there. His family uh, experienced refugee status when he was a kid. There was a Russian invasion of the Balkans in the late 1870s. So he spent a good deal of time at Istanbul as a refugee. And this helped really fuel his nationalism. It's worth mentioning that the Young Turks, despite the name, some of them actually were not ethnically Turkish. Some of them were Jews. Some of them were Greek, actually. Uh, I think one was Greek. Um, there were other Albanians. I mean, there, was, there were other ethnicities that were represented. So, um, I think there was even one Armenian, maybe, who was a Young Turk. But, at any rate... Uh, it it wasn't quite just pure Turkish nationalism. There was kind of this weird mix of Ottoman and Turkish nationalism, if that makes sense. And an, a debate over what Ottoman nationalism would even mean. But, yeah, it, it, got, it got a little murky there. Okay, so um, when Talat was 16, he actually dropped out of his military high school after he had a dispute with the headmaster. He was a very intelligent student, however, and in general, he could be pretty headstrong. He was sort of like Enver in the sense that he definitely self-identified as a genius. 
And he also took a lot of pride in the fact that he had risen from humble circumstances. So he took pride in the fact that he had accomplished as much or more than his contemporaries who had wealthier families. And this is something that he reminded people of a lot. Um, he was able to win adherents consistently by being very approachable. He had a fun, sort of nasty sense of humor. He had a quick wit, and he was known for being very ruthless and efficient at achieving his objectives. So he also had a kind of charisma, but it was a little bit less swaggering than Enver. So he definitely had his adherents as well. He worked for a while after dropping out of military school at the Directorate of Post and Telegraph, so basically the, the post office, at what is now Thessaloniki, when it was still Salonika. That was the uh, Ottoman name for Thessaloniki. And he rose through the ranks rapidly at the post office because he was an excellent organizer. And then he joined the Young Turks, which meant that he was able to help them get their shit out there. And also, he was one of the few guys who was non-military and who had really good organizational skills, so he began to gain cred with most of his fellow Young Turks. He had a skill set most of them didn't. So after the Young Turks Revolution, he was involved, and because of his organizational skills, he was made Minister of the Interior in 1911. So he's not one of the initial savior officers or anything like that, but by the time the war starts, his power is very firmly entrenched. Um, so just as Enver was called the Napoleon of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Revolution, some people referred to Talat as the Danton of the Turkish Revolution. So when the CUP was restored after a brief uh, counter coup, I forgot to mention that there was a counter coup in 1912 or so. Uh, after that, Talat was really the guy who took over and basically just dictated reforms. So he's the guy who really stripped away most of the rights of the royal family, the Osmanlis. And he also, after the loss of a lot of the Balkans during the First Balkan War, he really was um, one of the guys who was willing to do literally anything to prevent the loss of lands in the Turkish heartland. And that's part of why he thought up the Armenian Genocide. He thought that this would build enough cohesion that the Ottomans would band together to defeat the British. And he thought that you had to make an extraordinary sacrifice. So that's what he was thinking. And that's why when he met with Enver after Enver really fucked up at Sarakamish, he's the one who proposes this. And it ends up being the guy who plans and organizes the whole thing. As I mentioned, the plan was to march the Armenians all around the empire and then have them die due to exposure, lack of supplies, and hostile locals. The troops didn't actually kill them. They just put them in harm's way. And that required a lot of organization. But even with his organizational skills, the Ottoman Empire could not sustain the logistical needs of this. So it ended up breaking down the empire. And then by the summer of 1915... Talat also apparently was legitimately anti-Armenian, by the way, not just using it purely for um, this purpose of trying to rally the troops. But he, he bragged that he had done more to harm the Armenians in three months than Abdul Hamid had done in 37 years. And he might have actually written that letter to the Sultan himself, the deposed Sultan, who was still alive at the time. As we'll see, a lot of these guys uh, were very, very proud of their war crimes. And we'll, we'll get, I hope we get the one, you might not be here when we get to him, but there was one of these guys, Sean, who said, uh, he met with the Armenians and he said, I have killed half a million of your co-religionists. I can offer you a cup of tea. Jesus. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of these guys, wow. uh, so it's amazing the official policy of the government later on was to try to deny that the Armenian genocide had occurred, but a lot of the generals involved in it wrote memoirs <laughs> talking about their role in it and bragging about their body count. Um, yeah, it's always been odd to me. It's always been odd to me, too. Like, um, <clears throat> like, if you think about like, the Nazis who were like, oh, the Holocaust didn't happen. I'm like, 
Wait, wait. I, I looked at the speeches. You guys really don't like Jews. I mean, shouldn't you be owning this? Well, in this case, uh, these guys do own it. At least the generals involved. I mean, they are they're quite proud of what they did, despite the fact that it really fucked. Oh up no, no. Life. I meant like. But, oh, but Itzaki said publicly they denied it, though. Uh, the government officially denies it, but a lot of these guys who are retired will oh, okay, proudly gotcha. beat their chest and talk about it. I mean, with one reason why the government does deny it, though, is because Ataturk realizes that this is not good PR for the country. But a lot of these other guys don't see it that way. Mm. I see, I see. Okay, I got a little confused there. All right, well, okay, that's, that is uh, that is different than some of the stuff I've read. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's see. What else does Talit do? He estimated, and this guy was the best record keeper in the Empire, estimated that he had killed or relocated... 924,000 out of the Empire's 1.5 million Armenians. Uh, and he thought that this was a crowning achievement. He thought that this made him a great man. Um, in the estimate of the historian of the Ottomans, Lord Kenros, who wrote a long book about them in the 70s, he said that Talat is the most capable of the three triumvirs, but uh, also the biggest monster. Uh, because, again, he was trying to sort of do the living space thing like the Nazis did for the Turks. Just for the Turks rather than the Germans. And, I mean, this is a guy who looked at genocide and said, this is fucking awesome. I'm doing a great job. He uh, was, a, was he a pan, was he a pan Turk guy as well? I don't think so. I don't know, though. I think he was more of a, I think he might have been a little bit more in line with Turkish nationalism than the more subdued sense, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. So, just like a lot of these guys, he had to flee to Germany after the war, but he was assassinated in Berlin by a young Armenian who had lost his whole family to the genocide, and they, he was put on trial in Germany for the murder, but after two days the jury decided to acquit the man because it was an act of revenge. And they said, you know what? It's understandable. We get it. We'll let him go. And well, interestingly enough, there was a law student present at the trial named Raphael Lemkin. And he was troubled by the fact that only the assassin was treated as a criminal and not the government of Talit. Because he thought that was the real criminality he was pulling off the genocide. And then this same guy, Raphael Lemkin, later on, he was a Polish Jew. Uh, we know what happened there a generation later. And he would actually be the guy who would coin the term genocide. So he'd been thinking about the issue consistently since the early 20s. And then by the time it starts to happen in his own land, he has a term for it. So that's where the word genocide comes from. Mm. Uh, as for the post-war Turkish government... They do honor Talat's memory by granting his wife a mansion and a pension. And they also took the bloodstained shirt that he wore when he got assassinated, and they put it on display in the military museum at Istanbul. And as we'll see, the way that the Ataturk government dealt with different people varied a lot. So while they are trying to deny the genocide happened, they are taking literally the architect of the genocide and honoring him as one of the country's greatest heroes. And also treating him as a military hero, even though he never served a day in his life. <coughs> hmm. So what do you think of Talat? I think an assessment is right that he is actually a man of talent, but also um, the uh, most bloodthirsty uh, and ruthless of all the ones on here. Um, yeah, I don't have too many other opinions, though. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with rating him is that I'm not sure if anyone else could have done his job as well. The problem is that his primary initiative was the Armenian Genocide, and that did immense damage to the Ottoman cause. So it actually backfired completely. You can sort of see the logic behind what he was doing, but it, it failed horribly. And also, of course, there's the moral aspect of it, which I guess we'll ignore for now. But, um... Yeah, it, it makes it hard to assess him. But, I mean, it's, it can't be very high, though, just because uh, the, the the fallout from this was extremely and entirely negative. 
So I mean, I'm thinking maybe an E. Um, yeah, whatever you'd like to go with on him is uh, good with me. All right, because I mean, I, yeah, he's. I mean, like we said, he's a monster. He was a capable monster, but his plan was not exactly well conceived. Let's see. Um, <coughs> all right. Was the Armenian genocide? Wait. One thing with the Armenian Genocide, I mean, from his point of view, it was successful, in his point of view, right? Yeah, because his his whole goal well, was to blame successfully blame the Armenians for Ottoman struggles, and also kill a bunch of them and clear out land in Anatolia for Turks. And apparently the sort of psychotic side of him only came out after the Balkan Wars, where he said, holy shit, us Turks are being pushed out of our lands. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I wonder, what, do you know of his, what his memory, what how, how he's thought of in Turkey today? I don't know, actually. I mean, I imagine it depends on whether or not you're part of the Turkish population that believes in the genocide. I imagine if you don't believe in it, he's probably pretty highly regarded. If you do, then, yeah, he's probably at the at the top of the shit list. Yeah, it's an anecdote, but my, my brother worked for a bunch of Turks at uh, Cafe Roma, which was uh, near Magazine Street here, and he worked with them before, he worked there before Hurricane Katrina, and, you know, they just kind of hang out or whatever, and then one time from Russia with Love was on TV, and they, like, called up everybody to go, Istanbul's on TV, so they all came in to look, watch the movie. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, but, but he remembered uh, that the guy voted against John Kerry. And my brother just asked him, like, oh, why are you voting for uh, Bush? And he said, John Kerry spoke poorly of the Armenian Genocide. The Armenian Genocide was good. Huh. Yeah, so I guess he I mean, probably, and... he's probably got, like, a picture of talent on his wall. <laughs> but, like, he, I mean, he apparently told my brother this not, like, any, like, trolly fun way. Like, he just dead serious. Damn. Well, uh, that's a disturbing encounter with a colleague, I think. <laughs> Good boss to him, though. You know, <laughs> he gave him a uh, uh, gave him a wad of cash right before Katrina uh, to, to you know help out with expenses. Oh, anyway, well. so <coughs> now we get, so uh, moving on. There. Yeah, now we get to the final member of the triumvirate, and despite his obvious uh, distinctive beard, he is not the person on this list who has the nickname of bearded. That would be Ahmed Kamal. Pasha. Uh, sometimes his name is spelled and pronounced Jamal, so I'm not sure if it's supposed to be pronounced Kamal or Jamal. I've seen it both ways. Um, either way, he is the third of the Triumvirs. He's by far the least prominent. He will do the least in the war. Now, of course, that he still has a lot to say in the meetings, and he has a lot of pull. He's, I think, the oldest of the three. He was born in 1872 which means that he would have been in his 40s during the war, whereas the other two, I believe, well, actually, I think he and Talit were in their 40s, Enver was in his 30s. He was born on uh, the island of Lesbos, so he was born, he's possibly Greek ethnically. Either that or he was born uh, to someone in the garrison, I'm not entirely sure. He served in a number of staff positions, and then in 1905, he revealed himself as a liberal. And by this point, Ottoman politics in the army was super political, and so your political affiliation could really help or hinder your advancement. But um, the liberals were pretty closely aligned with the Young Turks in terms of their goals. That wasn't a complete match, but basically he negotiated his way in to the Young Turks, and he became a member of their secret committee right before the revolution. And that put him in a very good position going forward. Partly because I think he was still seen as the link to other liberal groups. So putting him in the triumvirate was a way to kind of show that the CUP was something of an alliance. Whereas Talat and Enver were more of the hardcore of the Young Turks. So he's Jamal's more of the other part of the coalition, if that makes sense. Uh, so, once he becomes part of the secret committee, he will remain 
in that role until the government that he ran fell in 1918. He actually is the opposite of Talat in terms of his attitude about the Armenians. When he was a major and he was stationed in the east from 1909 to 1911, he helped Armenian victims who were dealing with the fallout from an earthquake. And in general, he seems to have had a lot of reservations about the genocide once it starts. He governed a lot of land in the east later in the war, and it seems that the body count of Armenians in his area was much, much lower than comparable areas. So he is not on board with what uh, Enver and Talat are doing when it comes to the genocide. Now that being said, deaths do occur on his watch, but this is not something that he's happy about. Uh, he also, unlike Enver, met Kamal, and they became friends while he was stationed in the east. So that's also very different. Um, that being said, despite initially being friends, they did fall out by 1913 over policy. Uh, it's worth mentioning, well, we've gone over this a number of times in previous streams, but if we're looking at professional officers, a lot of them tend to be rather difficult people with very strong opinions. So it should come as no surprise that most of them don't like each other. So initially, he's friends with the future Ataturk. Later, they become enemies. But it is what it is. In 1911, he was the governor of Baghdad, but then he left his post in order to fight in the First Balkan War, where he was a commander near Salonika. He then took over as commander of Istanbul in 1913, it was in that capacity that he actually finally officially joined the Triumvirate with Enver and Talat. And because he's the last member to join, he is by far the least influential. Um, he also pushed very hard for French alignment. So Talat was much more pro-Germany. Uh, from what I understand, Enver was a little bit more pro-French than German, but he could go either way. Uh, Jamal, though, is looking very heavily at the French. That's where he wants to throw his uh, support. And partly it might be because he doesn't want to fight the Russians. I don't know. But of course, as I mentioned, he's not the most influential. He does not get his way. So his advice was ignored. He was appointed the, as Minister of the Navy when he became a member of the Triumvirate. And when Enver was planning his grand offensive to start the war, he chose Jamal as the guy to command the other major offensive against the Suez Canal. So Jamal will go there and ultimately not really achieve that much because he's given a small army. He's not able to achieve surprise. He will try several times to take the British off guard, but he can't. They're also supported by naval gunfire. They have more men. He's approaching from a desert, so it's just an impossible operation. He does his best, but he can't pull it off. So he has to fall back to Palestine, set up a defensive uh, arrangement, and do as well as he can. However, it's worth pointing out that despite uh, the fact that this could have been a disaster, it really was more of a disappointment. He definitely loses more men than the British, but his army is intact. So he's not Enver Pasha levels of stupid. Uh, he's got his command of the 4th Army. That's the designation of his army. He will hold Syria and Palestine. And effectively, one of the abilities that he had because of his status as a triumvir is that he had the ability to either sign off on or countermand Talat's decrees when they reached his area. So basically, he could kind of do what he wanted within his area of command. Here, however, while he was much more lenient to the Armenians, he was very harsh to the Arabs. And part of that is because he's the first person, or one of the first, to recognize that the real threat to the empire is not the Armenians, it's the Arabs. Because the Arabs are the majority in many of the empire's regions. But um, his harshness backfires. Because by cracking down hard on the Arabs preemptively, he really fuels the fire of the later Arab Revolt of 1916 to 17. Which, of course, is also fueled by the fact that they see other ethnicities getting picked on by the Turks. 
So those two things combined really helped to build up the Arab revolt. Uh, during the genocide, he spoke out pretty loudly against outright liquidation, and he really wanted to relocate or convert as many Armenians as possible. Uh, although it is possible that uh, of the 300,000 Armenians who were within his jurisdiction, about half of them died, which of course is a horrific number, but comparatively, by percentage, it actually was not as bad as most. Uh, let's see. At one point, he engaged on his own with the Entente and talks about ending the war. If the Allies would recognize him as a king of independent Syria. So at a certain point, he just gave up on his other Ottoman officers and tried to become king of Syria. That's how fed up he was with Enver and Talat at one point. As commander-in-chief, his most notable success was overseeing indirectly the defeat of the Mesopotamian ex expeditionary force. Now, on the tactical level, that owed much more to Baron von der Goltz and uh, the general in command of the Ottoman army directly, whose name eludes me at the moment, but we'll come to him later. Um, Lawrence of Arabia met Jamal at one point and left a really colorful sketch of him. I don't remember what, it's, what he said, though. Uh, Jamal continued to crack down harder on the Arabs. He rounded up some leaders. And, yeah, it, this made things worse and worse and worse. He also became skeptical of the Germans, right as their influence was really growing as uh, they went at Kut and they went at Gallipoli. And he actually is demoted by Enver, and his fourth army is made a part of the Yildrum army group under the command of the recently arrived Falkenhayn. And his forces are then pushed back by the British in 1917. He resigns his command and goes back to the capital because he's fed up with things. He tried his best to get civilians out of harm's way from the coastal cities of Jaffa and other places, but the Germans would countermand his orders, so that's part of why he left his command. He didn't like to have his authority challenged in that way, so he was unwilling to continue in command. Um, let's see. He also had to flee to Germany after the war was over for the same reason. Um, but the case against him was not from the Armenian Genocide. It was because of his cruelty to the Arabs. He later went to Switzerland and then ended up in Afghanistan where he was training and modernizing the Afghan Royal Army. But when the king of Afghanistan sent him to a conference at Tb uh, Tbilisi in Georgia in 1922, he was assassinated by a few Armenians who happened to be there and learned that he was going to attend. So what do you think of Jamal? I think he's also called the Greater Jamal because there's another guy named Jamal who's a general. Uh, not too many notes in particular here. Uh, interesting to note another guy assassinated by an Armenian. Yeah, I mean, well, it's um, kind of like, remember, the Israelis after World War II went after Nazi generals. Uh, the Armenians had that same exact idea 20 years earlier. Yeah, but a little, a little different. The The Israeli thing was like, you know, capture you, bring you to Israel, you know, do what they did to Adolf Eichmann with the trial. Um, you know, although, I'm, I mean... Although, you know, like, all the Nazi big fish are dead, so if they catch anybody nowadays, it's like some guard, you know. Um, but uh, the Armenian thing's different just because they don't really have a country at this time, per se, so it's just, like, just kill the guy. It's uh, kind of impressive. Yeah, no, they, uh, they did not fuck around when it came to getting revenge, so... Uh, yeah, all the more so because you find a lot of genocidal uh, leaders don't really uh, get assassinated or murdered by their um, victims. I mean, that even the case of the high-ranking Nazis. I mean, it wasn't the Jews who took down Hitler and Himmler. It was the, you know, Soviets. Yeah, most of the most of the guys we'll talk about who are involved in the genocide do not get assassinated. Most of them die of old age in Istanbul <laughs> while smuggling. Gotcha, but two Yeah. 
while smugly talking about how the great the sure. genocide was. Gotcha. Yeah, it's still interesting to note that it was two of the biggest fish, but no, I don't I, I don't have any notes here. Yeah, for Jamal, I'm thinking a C or a D. Uh, he's, I, I think as a military commander, he seems fairly competent, but he just was given a task he couldn't pull off. Uh, his handling of the Arab situation was complicated. He didn't do the greatest job, but at the same time, he did understand that the Armenian genocide was a bad idea, and he also did foresee that an yeah. Arab revolt was coming, and he got ignored on both counts, and the Empire was worse off for it. So, I'm thinking maybe a C. <coughs> yeah, sounds good to me. Okay. All right, All right so you want uh, me to go ahead to uh, Kamal, right? Yeah, let's talk about Mustafa Kamal, better known by his later name, Ataturk. Yeah, father of the Turks. Um, okay, so Mustafa Kemal was uh, one of the ones born in, I guess we would call European uh, Turkey. He was actually of Albanian descent, from what I read. Um, I want to say, I'm trying to remember where he was, in uh, Thessalonica, actually, so around that area. Thessaloniki, so northern uh, Greece. Thessaloniki. Yes, yes, Thessaloniki. Um <laughs> Anyway, he was a very successful student and was eventually was able to attend the Ottoman uh, War Academy. The War Academy, of course, was about a th was a three year a three year course, very intensive. And to graduate from the academy you would, would be your best shot at high command. At this time, the Turks are very much trying to copy the Germans, much as the Japanese were at the same time. They figure you've got the best army in Europe; we're going to copy you, kind of like how. You know, like, before the Civil War, Americans were always copying the French because they believed they had the best army. It's kind of like that. You know, you're, a, you're an up-and-coming power. There's a whole thing about copying who you think is the best. Uh, anyway, uh, he actually was a member of the Young Turks. Uh, but not, not as prominent a member. His first taste of warfare... And that's, that's the thing I read about this too, by the way. Uh, there was this idea in the Ottoman War Academy that you would serve with the infantry, artillery, and the cavalry for a year each. So you'd have experience in all different types of formations. So <laughs> I don't know if he commanded artillery, but he definitely, command, he definitely was with infantry and cavalry for a time. But anyway, he was sent to Libya. And he's what, what the Turkish strategy was in Libya when the Italians attacked is they, they knew they really couldn't get a large force there or even support it. So the idea was to have Turkish regulars team up with locals and in many ways fight a guerrilla war. This is what Ataturk's first experience is, and he was very successful at this. <clears throat> this has a big influence on him as a military commander as well. Uh, he definitely believed in the offensive, but also in good preparations and speed. He liked, he liked fast tempo of operations. Anyway... Uh, he did staff work during the First Balkans War. Did very well there. So he's an up-and-coming officer. But then the First World War begins. And he condemns... He doesn't condemn. That's too strong a word. But he very early in the war says Germany's going to lo probably lose. And we're making a mistake allying with the Germans. And he seems to have admired a lot of German military practices. But he did not trust their advisors which gets him into some trouble in 1917. So when the First World War starts, he's essentially sidelined, but is eventually given command of the 19th Division. Uh, this division was under strength because a lot of the forces had been sent uh, south to the Sinai Front. <coughs> but you then have the Allies trying to force the Dardanelles. <coughs> which, by the way, in the chat... So I mentioned that that um, convention we were asked about earlier is the convention that the Turks have controlled the Dardanelles. Ah. Uh, you know, which is the subject of what would the Turks do with that in relation to Russia with the current uh, war in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, it's a whole the can of worms. Anyway, so he first gains fame because the Gallipoli landings happen in his area. And he orders a series of attacks to contain, contain the Anzac landings. I believe his famous line was something like, I'm not ordering you to charge, I'm ordering you to die. 
Yeah. But one of the things that would... Well, yes, yes. Well, I mean, he understood his desperate situation. And another thing to understand about Kamal as well is that he he's definitely a commander who has no problem going to the front line to rally troops. He, in some ways, he's like one of the very last throwbacks to the old uh, Napoleonic style, which I forgot to mention that that's probably not surprising. He was very much interested in obsessive Napoleon. <clears throat> he is a thoroughgoing Francophile. And that you've already mentioned this with a lot of the other Turkish leaders. That's kind of a general thing in the Ottoman Empire in some ways dating back to King Francis II in the 1500s, that the French and the Turks, um, a lot of times the Turks would, uh, the French and the Turks would have an alliance at that time. There was a lot of trade between the two, but also, for instance, during the Napoleonic Wars, when the Turkish military was trying to reform, they tried, they hired uh, French officers to come over. An example there. So, the idea of being a bunch of Francophiles is, 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 is not terribly surprising, but Pasha did, I mean, sorry, not Pasha, Kamal did even more than that. He, he was a big fan of Enlightenment philosophy, like uh, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Voltaire. He was a big admirer of these men. Uh, anyway, so his brilliant attacks contain the landings. Uh, Lyman von Sanders actually has him given an iron cross. Now, Sanders is interesting. Sanders held most Turkish officers in a low regard. Mustafa Kemal is definitely an exception to that. Although, it should be noted that Sanders was impressed by Ottoman soldiers, like their, what he considered their toughness, but he thought their officers were terrible. Anyway, Kemal is the exception. Eventually, Kemal is essentially a, a corps commander and oversees attacks in August of 1915 <coughs> that... Um, are successful in containing and further limiting Allied gains. This is around the time he becomes a bit of a hero in Turkey. And anyway, he was given command of a field army in 1917. This did not last terribly long. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to add. He was he was involved in the Caucasus uh, campaign in 1916. But anyway, 1917. He was made commander of Seventh Army, and that was under von Falkenhayn in the uh, what do you call it, the Yildirim Arm, uh, Army Group, the Yildirim Army Group. Yeah, he one of one of Kamal's weaknesses because usually this is something that will sink your career. Career, I find, but he can be very very blunt with his superiors. This this of course led to him being sidelined in 1914 because he did not think that Germany actually had a chance and Turkey was making a big mistake. <clears throat> it's the same thing here. He advised the Turkish high command that they should not attack. That, okay, we've, we've been successful so far at Gallipoli and Baghdad. We are, um, we've, we've contained the Russians a bit in the Caucasus right now. The allies down in Palestine haven't, made much, haven't had much success in Sinai-Palestine area. So his thought was, we should consolidate our forces because he could see that they were running out of resources. And, you know, the central powers could not support them as effectively. So he's like, look, we have limited resources. We should consolidate our forces. And his idea was <coughs> let the Allies attack us and then we use reserves to counterattack. Which, if you think about it, that's essentially what they did at both Gallipoli and Baghdad in a lot of ways. So he's following a successful template. He also was very critical of the Germans and essentially said that the Germans were making that were telling the Turks to attack because it, it's, it was not because it was in Turkey's interest, because it was in Germany's interest that the Turks attack. Uh, the result is he is sidelined again. But in July 1918, uh, Mehmed VI, who uh, was an admirer of, of Kemal, has him recalled. He is once again given command of 7th Army, which at this point is in Palestine. Uh, for many, this is one of his finest military hours. So he is involved in the um, in Allenby's offensive through Palestine, the Battle of Megiddo. And he is actually able to preserve 7th Army and other Turkish forces in a retreat that takes them essentially from near Jerusalem all the way to as far north as Aleppo. And this is no mean feat. Not only is he doing a retreat, the not only is he overseeing a successful retreat, but 
The Allies have a much more mobile army, and they're commanded by Allenby, who is easily one of Britain's best in this war. I would say by easily the best, period. <laughs> easily the best, period, yeah. The case can be made there. But think about this. He, he's able to extract his army, which is less mobile, lower morale, and against a relentless opponent. And being attacked constantly by Arabs while retreating. Yeah, and... Yes, yeah, Lawrence and uh, Abu Abatai and the rest. Also should be noted that um, there were a few times when the rear guard, where he pulled a Marshal Ney, and went to fight with the rear guard. <coughs> um, so anyway, uh, the war is over. Um, I'm not going to get into two. I mean, you know, I, I'd have to read a whole. I, I just read a book that was strictly about him as a military commander, and I don't want to go into a ton of detail about what he did during the Turkish War of Independence, as they call it, the war against uh, the war with the Greeks, where uh, he was very, very successful against the Greeks, surrounding two Greek corps and destroying them. Um, but that being said, you know, he, this man's life could fill an entire stream. He's, of course, considered the founder of the Republic of Turkey. Um, he is a much admired figure. He... He's, like I said, he was obsessed with Napoleon, the French Revolution, the Enlightenment, and you can really see that, I would say, in his, in his creation of the Turkish Republic. It follows a kind of French template. That is to say, a secular republic <coughs> that is deeply nationalistic. Uh, I was in Turkey over 20 years ago, and I went into one shop, and of course, in that shop, there was a picture of Ataturk. And I'd been told before that if you're in Turkey, you'll just see pictures of him, and you do. Uh, you remember that book you uh, mentioned as a dumb name, uh, Scipio Africanus, Greater Than Napoleon? Yeah, by B. H. Del Hart, I think. Yeah, I think I think actually you could write the book Mustafa Kemal, Greater Than Napoleon, because Kemal is not just a great, brilliant military commander, but a superb statesman, and so was Napoleon. But you know, Napoleon has tragic flaws you know um which by the way i've been told that to use that phrase is considered anachronistic but i think it's the way to go uh i, th I, th I think in uh, thousands of years from now a lot of our psychological phrases will be discarded or ignored but the, I, the 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 term tragic flaw will always be with us and napoleon has tragic flaws um ataturk like anybody does have flaws but kamal is actually able to do what Napoleon is not able to do in many ways. Um, so, and in that regard, he also reminds one of George Washington as well. Although George Washington was not nearly as talented a military commander, I would say. Definitely not. Um, yeah, that, that, that's probably worth an entire stream as well, just doing George Washington's military career and just going over the ups and downs because there's a hell of a lot of those. It's, it's one, Washington's easily one of the most erratic military commanders of all time. <coughs> but anyway, so um, I would like to only say that while all this is true, Ataturk, to, from what I've read, is a, much, is a somewhat more controversial figure in Turkey. They've kind of embraced, it seems to me... Um, Islam more as of late and one theory about that is that the people who are very big on Ataturk live in the cities and these people really weren't uh, they were saying like the, the, the articles reading said that they um, they didn't have a lot of kids right but the people in the countryside had a lot of kids in the countryside he's not as popular because of his uh, because he went against certain traditions like banning the Fez for instance and he moved Turkey. I mean, never, not that Turkey was ever a super Islamic state, but he moved even further away from that. So I, I mention that because we're singing his praises here. That doesn't mean he's not a figure without controversy or debate even today in Turkey. <coughs> but purely from a military point of view, uh, this man's easily an S tier. The book I read made a great point. It said that he had success in the mountains and the deserts. He had success being a relatively junior officer and a staff officer he had success command a, a regiment division army army group and in that regard also you could say greater than napoleon because you know napoleon went from commanding some artillery to leading an entire army right away um 
And an argument's been made that that's one of the things that limited Napoleon tactically was that uh, he may not have been as tactically adept, at least in terms of minutia of tactics, better grand tactics. But somebody like, Ad- somebody like Kamal just masters at every level, as opposed to, say, like John Bill Hood, right? Yeah. Who's this great brigade and division commander. He's kind of a mediocre corps commander and, you know, a, a poor army commander. So it's it's all over the place. But a guy like Kamal has success on all levels. That's true. So I think easily an S tier. Yeah, he's one of the best generals of the, the entire <coughs> conflict. And one of the few guys who really made a name for himself in a conflict where most generals just looked at the task before them and fell way short. Um, I, I, I think his role at Gallipoli might be a bit exaggerated, though. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think... You think so? I think it might be a little bit, because almost all the accounts I read are about how he heroically had to rush back and forth with his core or his division before that and save the day, but there were plenty of other formations present. So I think that it's very likely that his role was exaggerated. That being said, he definitely was used as the fire brigade by Lyman, and uh, apparently he had to use some sort of injections, basically like or, or an early form of speed or meth or some shit to stay awake and keep enough energy up. And his health collapsed for a while, so he had to take a break after Gallipoli before he went back into service. Oh, he died at age 57. Now, that's worth noting as well. When he was when he was head of Turkey, he did support women's rights. Um, but apparently, like, his wife and him became estranged because even though he did that, he would at night he'd be like, look, I'm going to go, like, play cards and drink. <laughs> There's another thing too. He he liked being in the field and in combat, and he definitely liked to you know just have a good time. In yeah. addition to of course being a serious hard worker, uh, that kind of reminds me because I was reading up. I was actually been reading up on him in preparation for a tour. Kind of reminds me of the New Orleans mayor, a Dutch Morial, another guy who was um, you know hard worker, tireless, but you know when it's time to like let loose, he's going to let loose. Yeah. And I guess too, it's worth mentioning that his you know premature death in 1938, that's a large part of the reason why Turkey had so little influence on the course of World War II, is because the one guy with this outstanding international reputation wasn't there. So Turkey's leader was someone with much, much less standing than Ataturk would have commanded. Yeah. <laughs> Though I wonder how he would have reacted to um, events in the in, in World War II. I don't think he'd have gotten um, involved. If that's what you mean directly, because Turkey just was not equipped to fight World War II. But um, I think he still could have. No, been, no. Yeah, I think he might have been able to do some negotiation, especially as the war was winding down, because he would have had enough standing to hold conferences and. Uh, you know, be one of the guys trying to negotiate things. So I think just having him around as a senior statesman would have made a huge difference. Although possibly, <coughs> who knows how it would have played out. I mean, it's possible that the Nazis could have utilized Ataturk's uh, pull to try to get themselves off the hook a little bit. Well, I don't know about that. I, 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 I think you're right. Probably in World War II, he would have stuck with uh, neutrality. But I, but even before I'd say that, I'd really want to know what was his opinion of the other countries. What was his opinion of capitalism? Um, uh, and what would be his opinion of fascism, Nazism, and communism? I would say probably negative. Um, I would because guess, he found it a wrong. I guess you very know. negative when it comes to communism, just because uh, he ran into some difficulties with the Bolsheviks. And also his arch enemy, Enver, temporarily became one for like a minute before he you know, tried to start a new republic. Um. <coughs> but who knows? I mean, maybe maybe, uh, maybe, maybe Ataturk would have joined in in 1944 and made a run for Sofia and try to knock the Bulgarians out. Possibly, yeah. I mean, it, it, I wouldn't be super shocked if he tried to take advantage of it and join the Allies once it was clear that the war was over. Um But yeah, uh, it is a good what if, say, if he had had another eight years of life or something like that. 
I also wonder about the state of the Turkish army at the time. I know their navy in World War II was in very poor shape, very poor condition. The army was um, all infantry. And their air- army was all infantry. It's no armor. Okay. And their air force, what I read about, was hilarious. You know, like because they were essentially get, they were essentially buying equipment from both sides. So there's this great picture of like a Turkish air formation, and it's a fox wolf and a Spitfire just flying next to each other, friendly. You know, like, like everything's fine. Huh. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing they did do was use their neutrality to get people to give them weapons and hope they would join the war. But you know, they they decided not to, and the the British put a ton of pressure on them, but the Turks were smart enough to realize that they just wanted to use them as a meat shield because they knew there's no way in hell their infantry were going to be able to take on the Germans and really dislodge them from anything. Yeah, and, and now you're telling me they didn't have they didn't have any tanks then, right? Not really. I mean, not that I'm aware of. I don't think they had very many if they had a, a few, but uh, yeah. So you're telling me the board game, you're telling me the board game Rise and the Clan of the Third like, lied to me because the Turks in that game have like one or two tank units. They're, they're weak. They're very bad. Uh, I mean, that might actually be accurate, but again, you know, the Turks looked at the reality of the war and they said, there's no way we can make an impact without, we're just going to lose a fuck ton of people and accomplish nothing. Yeah. So, they wisely stayed out of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's Ataturk. I think very easily the best of the Ottoman generals. And definitely in the running for the greatest general of the war. I think there are a few contenders for that. He's one of them. Um, I'd, I'd definitely agree with that. Uh, <coughs> now, now we'll skip to the Baron von der Goltz. Are you familiar with the Baron? Uh, I know very little about him. I've seen his name in some readings before, but I don't know enough about him to say anything more. So we talked about how the Ottoman generals are all pretty young. Well, uh, Baron von der Goltz is among the oldest generals of the war. Um, He's also, he was so famous among the Ottomans that he was known as Goltz Pasha. That was not an official title, but just something they called him out of respect. So we mentioned that Germans had been training Ottoman officers for a while, and a lot of the guys who are now in charge of these Ottoman armies had been coming up through the system when Baron von der Goltz was teaching in Istanbul. Or some of them had also gone to Berlin to study under him. He was someone who was both an active officer in the German army and a renowned military historian whose works were read around Europe. One of his works on the uh, Franco-Prussian War, I think his Franco-Prussian War, was actually very popular in France. Um, so there were some of his works that were actually more popular outside of Germany. So this is a guy who's famous throughout Europe in military circles. He was born in 1843. So he's well into his 70s when World War I breaks out. And he had been retired for several years. Um, so he, uh, like I said, he had a long distinguished career. He had taught a number of places. In 1910, I think that was his last assignment, he actually went to Argentina to do for them what he had done for the Ottomans. That assignment didn't last very long. I think he retires in 1911, something like that. Um, One of the things that he taught was social Darwinism. So people such as Enver and Talat, when they're making their calculations, they very much identify as social Darwinist. And they would think back to what did von der Goltz teach us. I don't know if Enver was a von der Goltz guy, but, and of course Talent wasn't. I don't know why I said that, but a lot of these guys were. And certainly in the meetings of the CUP, the, a number of officers at any given meeting would be von der Goltz students. Uh, when he was stationed there, this was from 1883 to 1895. So once again, right in the sweet spot of when a lot of these guys were going through school. Um, he also was a militarist and an ultra-nationalist. So a lot of their exposure to the concept of nationalism came from a guy who was really, really into it. And in terms of militarism, the idea of the military being supreme over the civilian sector, 
and Verpasha clearly was a fan of that idea, von der Goltz might have popularized that for the Ottomans. So, here's someone who is arguably the greatest foreign influence on the entire Ottoman Empire. And he's still alive and kicking when the war breaks out. And not surprisingly, as soon as the war breaks out, the Ottomans request that von der Goltz be called back to service and sent to help them. And that's exactly what happens. Um, von der Goltz was someone who thought very highly of the Ottoman soldiers and really did his best to help them. He also was an apologist for the Ottomans. So, for instance, when there were... Um, when they went to war against the Greeks in 1897, he basically wrote articles saying that the Greeks were to blame and the Turks were blameless. He uh, went to bat for them when they were accused of atrocities in the East before uh, the Armenian Genocide. Because there had been brush-ups with the Armenians before that, but never on that scale. So basically, no matter what happened, he would always defend the Ottoman government. Um, so... He was a field marshal by the time that he retired. When he retired, he basically founded a right-wing version of the Boy Scouts or something like that in Germany. He was recalled, as I mentioned. And at first, he was the military governor of Belgium. But then, of course, he was sent to the Ottomans at their request. When he gets there, he does not have a clear role to play, though. Because they already have Lyman von Sanders as the guy holding the job that von der Goltz had held until 1895. So basically now these two guys will be at each other's throats. They're of different generations, they have somewhat different outlooks, and basically Lyman feels that his authority is threatened by the presence of this living legend. Whereas von der Goltz feels that he's being wasted because his official assignment is as the, as the military attaché to Mehmed V. I think earlier I said sixth, apparently he was the fifth. Um... And at this time, as we mentioned, he was basically not that powerful. So this is a, he basically just advises a, a sultan who can't really do that much. So he feels like this is a waste. Um, he also butts heads with Enver Pasha. But after a while, after Enver Pasha was humbled a bit by his experience in the Caucasus, he decides to empower the Germans. So he'd already made Lyman the commander at Gallipoli. Well, when the British mount the expeditionary force in Mesopotamia, he actually sends von der Goltz there with authority to take over. Because he figures, fuck it. It can't get much worse. So von der Goltz goes to Mesopotamia. He oversees the draw at Ctesiphon, which was actually headed up by bearded Nuruddin. Uh, here's another source of controversy, by the way. It's not entirely clear exactly how involved von der Goltz was with either the Battle of Ctesiphon or the Siege of Kut. Now, we know he was involved, but the exact degree to which he oversaw things and the degree to which he was issuing orders as opposed to suggestions, that is not entirely clear. Um, depending on the account that you read, there are different things that are said. So, I guess we'll just have to assume that he actually had a, a fairly decent involvement uh, for now, but it is not certain, let's put it that way. So, at Ctesiphon, there was a, a draw, basically. Uh, Townsend falls back, and then von der Goltz urges the Ottomans to move forward. At that point, Enver Pasha intervened and replaced the Ottoman commander, bearded Nuruddin, with someone else, and then they proceeded forward. The Siege of Kut went down, and the Ottomans were able to fend off three different relief columns before eventually they forced Townsend to surrender. Um, so, von der Goltz, I believe, might have died right before the final surrender at Kut. But, at any rate, he also was made aware of Enver Pasha and Talat's plans to do the Armenian Genocide. And he voiced his objections to Enver directly. He said that this was a bad idea. 
At first, he thought it was militarily necessary because he bought the line about Armenian uh, disloyalty, but then he thought better of it. And actually, he threatened, as soon as the deportation started, he said, I will resign and go home to Germany if you don't quit doing this. But before he could act on his threat, he died. And I think he was in, like, I think he was about 77 or so years old. Um, there was suspicion, despite his advanced age and being exposed to a pretty harsh environment, that he had been poisoned. When he uh, was br when he was buried, he was actually buried at the German consulate in Istanbul, because that was what he had requested in his will. So, what do you think about Baron von der Goltz? Uh, this seems like a very fascinating man. I want to <coughs> sorry read up more about him. Um, it's interesting that he uh, was big on um, social Darwinism but then also rejects the Armenian Genocide. Um, I wonder what else he wrote about. You see he was a military historian and theorist, right? You said he wrote about the Franco-Prussian War. Yeah, I think that was his biggest, most successful work, but he had several others. Okay. But yeah, no, no I think it's... Um, uh, what's your ranking on him? Like a B or something? Yeah, I was thinking... An A or a B. I mean, the problem is we don't know exactly how responsible he was for the battles he's associated with. But he, he did have some affiliation with them. So his status as a commander it also is not appears, nearly as firm as Lyman's. It also appears, though, that we're talking about the Turks having some tension with their German advisors. It appears that he's probably one of the German advisors they like the most. Yeah, I mean, with the exception of Enver, all the other Turkish generals pay very close attention when he talks. He's sort of their teacher, or the teacher of their teacher. So he is he is very much a superstar in their eyes. So okay. I think, I think I'll go with a B for him, just because... Uh, I would go with an A, but I don't really know exactly how involved he was. I don't want to give out A's too cheaply. Alright, uh, next up we have... I think probably the, more, the most uh, forgotten German general who fought for the Ottomans... And that would be Friedrich Sigmund George Freherr Kress von Kressenstein. He was born in 1870. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's pretty important, though, uh, despite the fact that he is not all that famous. He is still very important. He accompanied Lyman von Sanders to the Empire in 1913. Lyman was the official correspondent. Uh, Kress was more of like his uh, second he hailed from a wealthy family in Nuremberg. His father was a judge. When he turned 18, he entered the Bavarian army as an ensign assigned to the artillery. And by this point, uh, while there was an official Germany, apparently the Bavarian army was still technically somewhat separate. It's a weird organization that they had. I want to say there might have still been a separate Prussia in a sense. Anyway... Uh, we don't need to worry about those kind of details. Those are things I'll learn more about when we do the uh, German army. But uh, the point is that when the war broke out, he accompanied uh, Jamal Pasha's army to the Suez. Uh, one of Kress's areas of expertise, aside from artillery, was engineering. And the Ottomans knew that there would be a lot of engineering challenges getting their army across the Sinai, and trying to achieve surprise against the British at the Suez Canal. So, his job was to deal with the engineering challenges. And another part of his job was trying to construct pontoon boats to cross the Red Sea and achieve surprise. That he could not do. But it is to his credit, as the guy tasked with getting across the desert, that the um, force under Jamal did not suffer casualties from lack of supplies because a lot of times when you cross a desert that is a huge problem and especially when you have an army that is relatively slow that's mostly on foot so uh crest did a good job handling logistics but ultimately of course did not get the pontoon boats ready and he got them back to safety in palestine in the meantime, Jamal was impressed with Cress's performance and appointed him to be the chief of staff of his army, the 4th Army. 
And by the way, um, a lot of these guys who will command armies for the Ottomans did not have enough seniority or rank to command a German army. Kress is the ultimate example of that. Um, I don't know what his official rank was. I want to say he was only a major general, though. And also, Lyman, when he arrived, was, I think, a major general, but at the, we'll get into it later, but I think he got promoted due to the need for someone of sufficient rank in Istanbul at that moment. So the Germans just said, like, congratulations, you just jumped two ranks, because we have to have somebody. But anyway, um, so in the spring of 1916, it was clear that the British were building forward operating bases in the Sinai, and also extending their rail lines in preparation for a major offensive. That eventually, of course, came in 1917. Kress was now sent with his old army, and his goal was to try to seize the Suez Canal. Kamal remained behind with the main force in Syria in order to watch over the Arabs and uh, govern the area. Kress achieved surprise. The British did not think that the Ottomans had an offensive in them, and they had not seen more than small raiding parties for a year or so. Uh, Kress was able to drive back some of the isolated brigades on the outskirts, but ultimately he did not have enough force to really seize the railhead. And so uh, Kress had to abandon his drive on the Suez. He had, so he had a little bit of success. He knew he couldn't press any further, so he fell back. And um, this was the defender in this case was the British commander Murray. I guess we'll get to when we get to the British commanders. Um, oh no, sorry. Cress decided not to go to Suez, so he decided to try to seize the railhead at Romani. This is a new railhead they had established. Uh, the British commander was Murray, who did an excellent job on the defensive, despite being bereft of barbed wire and a lot of other things you typically use for defense. But Murray correctly scouted the ground and figured out exactly where Crest would strike. And so he planned out his artillery and machine guns accordingly and then used his cavalry to launch a counterattack. Crest did exactly what Murray thought he would do. So the British plan worked perfectly. However, despite the fact that Crest's moves were predicted and that the British did exactly what they wanted to do, Cress still delivered his plan competently enough, and actually he still gave them a hell of a fight because he actually launched a competent night attack, which was extremely difficult to do before the advent of night vision. Very rarely pulled off. So Cress is very good at keeping men in line and executing things, but he is predictable. The British also had a major edge in aerial recon. Overall, despite Cress pulling off a disciplined night attack, this was a disaster at Romani, and Cress ended up losing 9,200 of his 16,000 men, half of whom were taken prisoner. He did uh, make the preparation of setting up some defensive works in case he was driven back, and he had to fall back upon those when the counterattack came. But even still, it was a disaster. It could have been worse. Um, what's interesting, though, and partly this is because of something we'll get into next time when we talk about the British, which I guess will probably be late March, most likely early April. Um, the British are extremely critical of their generals, but not critical at all of non-British generals when it comes to World War I. So while the British won this battle quite handily and quite clearly, the British have no critiques of Cress's performance, but they're very critical of Murray. And basically, the critique is that he let some of Cress's men escape. Uh, so I find that interesting. We'll get to that at a later date. Um, That's interesting, too. That, that actually somewhat explains his portrayal in Lawrence of Arabia. The, uh, General Murray's in the movie for the first 30 minutes, and he's portrayed as being just like... Um, short-tempered, short-sighted, um, and it's interesting, too, in the movie that uh, you you uh, you mentioned something about artillery. It was interesting in Lawrence of Arabia is that they have this 
The symbol in the movie of power is artillery. So if you have artillery, then you're powerful. If you don't, then you're not powerful and nobody cares about you or you're not being taken seriously. So in the movie, Murray constantly complains how he doesn't have artillery. Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Murray, anyway. I think Murray has some problems later on, though. That might be where his reputation comes from. But, And I think he, he is known to have had a temper. He feuded with some other major commander... Uh, a little either before or after this he and some other commander were really going at it in an unprofessional way uh, so I mean he's got his problems but he's not a complete dumbass gotcha um, okay so by early 1917 Kress is effectively in command of 4th Army in Palestine Although in theory he is more he's more the chief of staff, whereas a man named Talib Bey is in command. But it's clear who's actually issuing orders. It's Kress. And this, of course, is by the time you have a uh, Falkenhayn in overall command. So he wants as many German officers as possible. He recruits Kress, who's already there to be one of his army commanders. Um, the British rushed an offensive forward in order to take advantage, in order to uh, prevent the Ottomans from reallocating troops from the Russian front, now that the collapse is going on there. And uh, Kress's defenses at Gaza will prove to be relatively good. So now he will defend against Murray. And this is, might be where Murray earned his negative reputation, because in this battle, the first battle of Gaza, uh, the Ottoman defenses are very competent, they were quickly built, and they didn't have much barbed wire, but the readouts were very well located and situated, so they had a great line of sight, and the area where the British advanced had no cover whatsoever. So Crest did a great job defending. Uh, Murray didn't do anything too special in the attack. The British lost 4,000 men, the Ottomans lost 2,400 and that was a pretty solid victory. Not exactly anything too resounding, but you got to remember too: the Ottoman army is inferior to the British army in terms of its weaponry and everything else. Uh, basically, at this point, Murray and another commander named Dobell began feuding, and basically each one was telling the press the other one was an idiot, but also claiming that they'd won the battle. And the press bought it. So actually, for a long time, people in the English-speaking world thought the first battle of Gaza was a British victory. It was not. Um, then after three weeks, there was a second battle of Gaza, April 17th, 1917. During the interval, Kress had greatly strengthened his initial frontal defenses. And basically, during a three-day battle, the Egyptian expeditionary force would completely wreck itself on Cress's defenses. With a total casualty uh, casualty count of about 16,000. And this led to the well-deserved firing of both, both Murray and Doble, or Dobell, however you say his name. And even a few months later, the wrecking of the EFF was so bad that when Allenby took command and inspected the, the Egyptian ex expeditionary force, said, these guys are not ready for further action. This formation is wrecked. Uh, so, the front was stable for six months before Allen B. could really do anything because of how bad Murray and uh, DeBell had really fucked things up. Um, Fourth Army's morale skyrocketed. They were pretty confident in their commander. Kress got two more divisions, and then his army was renamed the Eighth Army. And actually, this is the point where Falkenhayn arrived. I got my timeline a little wrong earlier. And this time, not only is it 8th Army, but Kress is the official commander. So no more pretending that he's not. And this army, uh, he will be part of the Yildrum Army Group. He fought a battle at Beersheba once Allenby attacked. He lost there. His men were outmaneuvered, and he was forced to fall back. He then fought at 3rd Gaza. He made a competent defense and withdrew after his position became outflanked. While he did lose technically because he had to abandon his position, he inflicted twice as many losses as he suffered, which again, considering that the Ottoman army is inferior to the British, is a very 
uh, solid testament to his ability. Later on, when the German-Ottoman relationship was breaking down and the war was ending, his German forces were redeployed to Georgia, where there was a pro-German government in place, and Kress's duty was to protect the area and its oil from the Ottomans and the Russians. They only had about 3,000 men, because there weren't that many Germans in the Ottoman Empire. And as a German commander, his rank was now only Major General. So despite the fact that he had been a successful army commander, this did not really improve his official standing within the German army. Um, Kress was able to reinforce his army when the Russians paroled some POWs, and he also drafted some Germans who had settled in the area back in the 1850s. So basically some civilians who happened to know German just got drafted into his army. Um, he had then had to fight the Ottoman general Vahit Pasha, and he had no chance because he was too badly outmanned, but ultimately German diplomats were able to get the Ottomans to relieve the heap and force him to fall back, force his army to fall back. Uh, the Germans then struck a deal with the Bolsheviks to the effect that uh, they would get a quarter of the oil from Baku, so now they don't have to worry about fighting the Bolsheviks. Uh, Baku then fell into the Ottoman hands. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Kress was preparing the mounted expedition into Azerbaijan to reclaim Baku, but then the war officially ended, so uh, he was recalled. Germany's on the brink of revolution. And Kress's men will be the last German soldiers to come home. They were ordered home on October 21st, 1918, but they wouldn't actually arrive until April 1919. He retired in 1929 and wrote a memoir along with a bunch of articles about his experiences fighting in Sinai, Palestine, and Georgia. He died in Munich in 1948. So what do you think about Kress? Uh, I have no opinion. All right, so my takeaway on him would be that... Um, he was, he clearly had his upsides as a commander. He was a very good defender. But he clearly was not a very skilled attacker. If you look at the operations where he was on the offensive, both as an advisor and as a commander, he doesn't get the job done. When he's mm -hmm. defending, however, pretty damn good. So for me, <coughs> for me, I'd say he's about a B. Okay. Fairly high B. Uh, I... So the next one is uh, Lyman von Sanders, right? Yes, the next general and the last German here will be Otto Victor Karl Lyman von Sanders. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll be going after this one for sure because I'm I'm pretty uh, uh, you know I need to get some rest and I'm I'm fading out pretty bad, man. All right. Well, uh, stick with me for this one and then uh, we'll let you go. Got it. All right. All right. <laughs> so uh, Lyman. He was born as Otto Lyman in 1855 in Pomerania. He came from a family that was relatively well off, but they were not Junkers. Even though this <coughs> was an area which was inhabited by Junkers. His grandfather most likely was a Jewish convert to Christianity. Although some of the details of his family tree are a little vague. By 1911, he had become a lieutenant general, but he only actually becomes a nobleman in 1913. And at that time... He adopted the Von Sanders part of his name because if you became a nobleman and you weren't born one, you could sort of make up your own Von whatever. And the reason he took that name is to honor his wife's family because his wife did come from a Junker family. And technically speaking, in German usage, the correct way to refer to him is as Lyman, not as Von Sanders because Lyman was his uh, surname. But most English-speaking sources refer to him as Von Sanders. So, that's something I learned. In 1913, he became the eighth and final German advisor to the Ottomans. And as you can imagine, when the legendary Baron von der Goltz arrived, Wyman was jealous about all the attention that he received. He felt that his authority 
was being undermined by the presence of the living legend. So the two of them really butted heads and did not get along. Um, if anything, there's a possibility that because of other people butting heads with the Baron, that once the Baron arrives and Enver sees that Lyman doesn't like the Baron, Enver's attitude against Lyman softens some. That he begins to side more with Lyman over the Baron, and that's why Enver is willing to appoint Lyman von Sanders to be the commander at Gallipoli. So as we mentioned, in March of 1915, the British began their offensive at Gallipoli. Enver appointed Lyman von Sanders to oversee the defense because he, his confidence had been shaken. And a lot of his bravado about Ottoman generals leading Ottoman troops had fled out the window. So um, Lyman is now in charge. When he first took over, the situation was very dire. There's only one Ottoman division in the area and almost no fortification. So basically what he told his staff is that he needed at least eight days to make this work or otherwise they would have no chance whatsoever. And he thought he'd be lucky to get eight days because the British had already made a naval attack and he assumed that the landing would come very quickly thereafter. But in fact, the landing was delayed in Egypt by a month. So that eight days turned into a full month and Lyman was able to assemble 84,000 men, many of whom were already entrenched. The problem is, it was hard to guess where the landing would occur on the Gallipoli Peninsula. So Lyman had to guess. And in the event, he guessed wrong. There was a diversionary landing by the French, which caused them to redeploy, which was exactly what Hamilton, the British commander-in-chief, had intended. And so uh, the Ottomans were extremely poorly positioned to deal with the Anzac landing. Now, he was caught out of position by a better equipped force, but he did adjust his lines and retain the high ground and kept the British at bay. He also began to really look at his Ottoman leaders and find men of talent, this is when he first identifies Kamal Mustafa as his go-to guy. So he'd often turn to Kamal Mustafa to be his on-point counterattacker, or to be the guy to rush to a position to defend it if the Allies were about to make a breakthrough. So in many ways, the rise of Ataturk owes a great deal to Lyman using him in this way and giving him the opportunity to really shine as a corps commander and become a national hero. So there was a secondary wave of this invasion, and Lyman was made aware of it because, again, Alexandria is the launch-off point for these expeditions, and news travels. It's hard to really conceal a force that's being kept in a city. So the Ottomans were fully aware that a second wave was coming. Lyman, once again, has to try to set up defenses and preparation for a new landing. Once again, he does not guess correctly about where the landing would occur. But luck was on the side of the Ottomans because the commander of the landing at Suvla Bay was Sir Frederick Stopford, one of the worst British generals of the war. A man who fucked around long enough that Hamilton actually had to go and investigate to see why he wasn't moving. So, Stopford easily could have gained the high ground just a few miles inland, which was the key point that he was supposed to seize. He could have done that on day one, but he instead waited days to wait for all of his men and supplies to land. And in the meantime, while he was doing that, guess who was able to move into position on the orders of Lyman? That's right, Kamal Mustafa. So by the time Stopford moves uphill, Kamal Mustafa's forces are there, and the British are unable to take the position. The only thing Stopford was able to pull off was creating a link between his men, who were uh, British, and then the Anzac force that had already been there. So they managed to unite their front, but ultimately the Ottoman line held firm. Um, 
Hamilton called for a third wave, but they never appeared because uh, the 95,000 men that they were contemplating sending against the Ottomans were needed on the Western Front. So that didn't happen. And uh, the French also, at this point, there were rumors that they were on the verge of tapping out completely. So uh, basically the Gallipoli campaign got deprioritized by the Entente. And by, by December 1915, the Entente were withdrawing quietly, and Lyman was determined to hammer the beachhead. He thought that he could destroy the army before it got off the beaches. He waited until there were only 19,000 or so men left to do so. But when he ordered his men to attack, they refused. Because although the Ottomans won at Gallipoli, the battle was every bit as hard on them, if not harder than it was on the British. Um, the Ottomans there were poorly supplied. They took massive casualties in both their defenses and their counterattacks. They were outgunned consistently. They were shelled constantly. So many of the men there were breaking down. We already mentioned how Ataturk, as a fairly young man, was forced to take stimulants in order to keep himself going. He was taking injections of some sort of early speed or whatever it was. Well, one man presented himself to Lyman when Lyman demanded to know why they wanted to counterattack, and the guy was completely gray, and he said that all, he and all his fellow soldiers were completely used up. And then Lyman asked him how old he was. He assumed this was an older man. The guy said, I'm 21. So these men had grown old before their time. They were shot to hell, and he gave up on watching the counterattack. Uh, throughout 1916 and 17, Lyman was in Istanbul. He was entirely working in an advisory capacity. Most likely this is because Enver did not want him to have any more opportunities to win a, a distinction. In 1918, he was then sent to take command of the Yildrum Army Group after Falkenhayn was smashed by Allenby. But by the time that uh, Lyman took command, the Army's morale was pretty much shot, readiness was gone, and his forces were doing little more were capable of doing little more than setting up defensive positions and waiting to get attacked. This is also uh, about the same time Sean was talking about with Ataturk, where Ataturk uh, fought at Megiddo. Overall, though, even though Ataturk did well at Megiddo, Megiddo was a complete disaster for the Ottomans. And Lyman was actually captured at, at the battle. Uh, once he was in captivity, he was kept on Malta for about a year. He was accused of a whole bunch of war crimes, probably the Armenian Genocide. But none of the charges stuck. There just wasn't any evidence that Lyman had any hand in that. Again, he had never been to the East when that was going on. He had been stuck in Istanbul, so uh, trying to make that stick just wasn't going to work. And in fact, almost everybody the British tried to put on trial, they were never able to make it stick. I don't know what the problem was, but for whatever reason, the British prosecution was just not there. I, my suspicion is that they didn't have enough international laws in the books in order to really uh, make the case. But at any rate, uh, it appears that Lyman really opposed the Ottoman government's plans for the genocide. This came out later. He thought it would be disruptive and a very poor use of resources. He was right on both counts, of course. He returned home in 1920. He retired. He wrote a memoir before that while he was still a British prisoner. It was only published in 1927. In 1929, he died at Munich at the age of 74. So what do you think of Lyman von Sanders? I uh, don't really have much of an opinion here. I know he's a card in Paths of Glory. <laughs> um, seems to have been a, he seems to have been a good commander. What do you think? I mean, to me, he's another B. Um, he was able to get the job done at Gallipoli, but in terms of his ability to plan, I mean, he guessed wrong twice in a row, and the second time it was a bad enough guess that they literally had to rely on pure luck to survive. <coughs> so it was only the well, incompetence of Stopford that really gave him an opening. I see. The first one, though, I mean, he did scramble pretty effectively. Yeah, he did. Position. 
And when it comes to the Yildrum Army Group, um, it's hard to judge because he inherited a bad situation. And, I mean, he wasn't able to do much with it. So I can't be too harsh on that. I mean, uh, that was a, no, he, that was a losing cause. Yeah, that's kind of like being like, man, Robert E. Lee should have really done more at Appomattox. Yeah, I mean, Sailor's Creek, how did they lose? <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, so for me, I think Lyman is a B. I think he's solid, but he's far from brilliant. All right. Well, I'm gonna go. Um... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, you said you want to do other another set of World War One commanders this month. Um, maybe this month. The other thing is, remember, we're, we want to do that one stream with uh, the moderator who wanted to talk about. Uh, Clayburn. So I guess we need to figure out whether we want to do an all Clayburn stream or Clayburn and a couple other people. Um, and we also, I think he's available on the twentieth and twenty seventh for that. So. Okay. Let me twentieth and twenty seventh. You say? Let me uh, look at the calendar real quick here. Um, neither one of those could work. I think I like to do Franklin Pierce sometime this month. I guess no assassination um, stream, but. You know, I, I won't be on March 13th, um, unless something changes, so... Is it, isn't that your birthday uh, proper, or is that just near it? That's the day before, but I'm going to be doing stuff the day before. Ah, I see. Um, yeah. Right. So, I mean, yeah <laughs> next, next time, I don't know what I'll do, but I guess I'll be flying solo for that one, so I'll figure that out and announce it. Probably so. Um... But anyway, yeah, so I think uh, maybe do um, that one, and I, I can could, I could get ready for Franklin Pierce if you want me to. Okay. So we can do those um, two, and then I guess get to early April, we can do the British Generals World War One. Yeah, sure, that sounds good. I'm... Uh, I'm like, like most people, I'm much better informed about them than I am the Turks. Well, yeah, it's also... Uh, uh, you know, not surprisingly, much, much easier to find information on the British. Yeah. <coughs> there was, there, there, there is apparently a really good book on the, um, I found out about today, on the Turks in World War One, uh, written by, uh, God, I can't remember his name right now, but, yeah, the other thing that hurts me right now, too, besides not being super knowledgeable on this, is just, just, I mean, this is not like a terrible cold by any means, but, you know, I'm not 100%. No, I think I got the same thing you've got, because uh, I can't say it's... It, you know, I've never felt it was a life-threatening illness, but at the same time, it did kind of knock me on my ass more than most colds. This, I would say, hasn't really knocked me on my ass. I just feel tired. Well, like, that's it, what the, I mean. The main thing with this... Like, I, you yeah. know, it takes energy to actually uh, <laughs> do shit, you know? To actually do work, so uh, I don't have it... I haven't had it most of this weekend until this afternoon, so. I can work in spurts. Like, I did some uh, Shiloh work today. Oh, probably sometime in the future, I'd like to do the Creek War and the Battle of New Orleans. Okay. And two. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but anyway, that's uh, that's pretty much it on my end. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Sorry that I couldn't stick around. That's all right. I mean, thanks for coming out. I know you weren't uh, feeling too great. All right, bye everybody. Enjoy the uh, enjoy the rest of the Turkish army. Uh, uh, one one question before I go: uh, Is a lot of these guys going to be like D's, E's, and F's from here on out? Not really. Uh, most of them weren't that terrible, and a lot of the problems that they encountered w were due to the terrible decisions that Enver Pasha made, and you know, put them in shitty positions. <coughs> okay. I mean, there are some who definitely suck, though. Don't get me wrong, but. Most of these guys are not as bad as I thought they'd be. So okay, all right, man. Well, you have a uh, you have a good one and good night, everybody. Okay. All right. Good night, Sean. Bye. All right. So now it's just you and me, audience. Let me see where we're at here and make sure that I uh, I'm sort of caught up here on what people are doing. So uh, Zach Gillum gave a few different donations. Thank you, Zach. He went for two, one, one, two, one. 
Uh, Talon, $2. Thanks for these streams. Well, thank you for attending. And then the most recent one is from Zach as well. He said, book giveaway. Sorry, Sean Sick. Shiloh, please. Um, we can bring back the book giveaway soon. I've got enough stuff I need to get rid of. I couldn't find anything that was relevant to tonight's topic. Uh, but if you guys want, we can do a book giveaway tonight. So, um, yeah. We'll do a book giveaway tonight. I've got one that I think you guys might like. And actually, we'll, maybe we'll do a couple different... We'll do three tiers about that. Three winners. And if you want to participate, you need to not only... If you're one of the winners, you will have to contact me on Discord uh, with your mailing address and all that and also your preference. So here are the three options that you get. One is that I have a proof copy of Greg Wolf's The Life and Death of Ancient Cities. So this is a copy that was sent to me to do a book review. Unfortunately, I didn't get it in time because of the mail system at OSU during the pandemic. So this one might have some weird typos and other things that you will not see in the publication copy. And if you're looking to see what a book looks like when it's just about ready for publication but not quite, well, there you go. Um, I guess the link to the Ottomans is that some of the more important cities of antiquity were in Anatolia. And also we talked about Thessaloniki. Uh, that I think is in the book, or it should be at least. So there's that. Uh, another option for tonight is I have a book on the American Civil War by Shelby Foote, the famous author, very popular. And that volume is the one that goes from Fort Donaldson to Shiloh. So it's early war, and it is um, a pretty good one. Another one that we can do for tonight... Huh... Is a book by David Runciman. What the fuck is the title? I can't see it because I got the books facing the wrong direction from here, but I'll look it up real fast because I don't want to get up and knock stuff over. Um, so let's find out. And this relates to uh, the perils facing democracy from World War One to the present. Let's see. It's not how democracy ends. That's not the one. It is the previous book by him. We'll just go to this one and then look up his uh, what he's written real fast. <laughs> because I have this book, but I'm not ready to part with it yet. I still have a couple things I need to do with it. Why is this not cooperating? Here it is. The Confidence Trap, A History of Democracy in Crisis from World War I to the Present. So, The Confidence Trap is an option. The copy of Life and Death of Ancient Cities, the proof copy that is, is an option. And that's one you can't get anywhere else, by the way, unless you also were asked to, um, you know, review it. And another one is the um, Shelby Foot book. So when you send your super chats, let me know what your preference is in case you're one of the three winners. And then from there, I will be able to determine who gets what. And I will also need you to contact me with your mailing info because otherwise, yeah, I can't really get it to you, can I? Uh, if you are abroad, we'll have to do something more uh, ebook oriented because uh, the mailing rates are just too expensive. So, all right. Now, back to our Ottoman generals. So we went through the ones that Sean was most likely to know. Now we'll go through the guys who were not big players on the world stage. Most of them actually did not have that big of a role in the Turkish War for Independence either. But all these guys were very important in their own time. And interestingly, many of the generals who had become the big wigs of the Turkish Independence War uh, were corps commanders in World War I and only rose to army command 
around 1920, 1921, 22, whatever it was. But as we'll see, some of these guys were involved in that process. The first guy we'll look at is one of the older Ottoman generals. That would be Mehmed Assad Pasha. He was born in 1862, which means that he was older than most of the guys he served with, but also, interestingly enough, he would live to a later date than most of them. He made it all the way until 1952, so this man lived to be quite old. He lived to be 90 years old. He was an Uzbek ethnically, but his family had settled at Yanya, which is the modern Greek city of Ionia. As an Uzbek whose family had settled in the Ottoman Empire in Greece, um, you know, he was one of the more, I guess you could call it, diverse members of the Ottoman Officers Club. He received a very good education as a young man, and he was known as an excellent student. He also had a considerably younger brother named Vahid Pasha, and his brother, the two of them actually both became army commanders during the First World War. You could make an argument that both of them supported the other in a way, because both of them had successes that were beneficial to the other, even though I don't think they planned it that way, or at least that's not how it appears to me. Um, one problem that Mehmed Assad had to overcome is that while he was a very smart guy, uh, he did not speak Ottoman Turkish very well. Because again, he's an Uzbek who grew up in Greece. So initially, he had to quit the academy because he just couldn't keep up. He didn't understand the language well enough. So he basically took some time off to shore up his language skills and came back. And when he did, he actually graduated from war, the War Academy first in his class in 1887. In 1890, his first assignment was the general staff. He then went to Germany for additional instruction. He spent time in the classroom teaching other officers. And he also inspected a number of units in Germany to get a sense for how they were prepared. At this time, the German army was, especially in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War, seen as the standard, the gold standard of European armies, and rightfully so. He learned to speak fluent German. He had a strong accent, but he was able to work pretty proficiently. Uh, he worked in intelligence when he returned to the Ottoman Empire, but then he went to teach at the Imperial War College. In 1897, uh, Mehmed Assad left his classroom to command the infantry division against the Greeks. He did fairly well in that role. From 1899 to 1907, he was the dean of the academy. And one of his students was Kamal Mustafa. Apparently they got along fairly well. In 1907, he took over the 3rd Army at Thessaloniki and was now at the center of CUP activism. His brother was one of the Young Turks, his younger brother we mentioned earlier. But Mehmet Assad decided to stay out of it. So on the one hand, he did not want to join this group of young rebels, but at the same time, he did not want to follow the government's directives and crack down. So he found himself in a no-man's land. And this is when Sultan Abdul uh, Hamid II was still in command. And so the Sultan dismissed him from service on the grounds that he wanted to do his job. So his career was over. But then, of course, the next year, the Young Turks come to power. And then the year after that, 1909, they had opposed Abdul Hamid II. So at that point, Mehmed Assad is restored to his rank, but he's demoted to the Major General because there's a law that was passed around this time to end rank inflation. And partly it's to allow more junior, i.e. younger officers who are now in political control, to hold high commands. So uh, he, take, he takes a step down, but... Considering at this time that colonels were considered high officers, being a major general is still pretty cool. So it's not actually a demotion. It's a demotion on paper only. When the First Balkan War broke out, he commanded a division at his home city of Yanya, or Ionia. And this command was expanded into a corps with him at the helm. 
He was able to hold off a superior Greek army with timely counterattacks for three months. And he definitely outperformed all expectations and gained a great deal of status and respect, including getting the honorific title of Pasha for the first time. So this is where he proved that he was more than an academician of war. He was someone who actually could put theory into the practice. After the First Balkan War, he was held in Greek custody, and he actually was not released until, I think, after the Second Balkan War. So his release only occurred in December 1913. But during this time, due to his experiences, he developed new ideas about the nature of warfare. And he concluded, being one of the first to do so, that the defense was now dominant. Attacks needed to be very carefully planned, and you should only attack when you had an excellent chance of success. Otherwise, if you attack on a whim, you're just throwing lives away and you won't succeed. So basically, he was well ahead of the curve on that. He took up command of the Third Corps, and he began to train his men and officers very carefully. He, Mehmed Assad had high standards, but he was also patient and fair. When officers would fail him, he'd give them second chances before he would finally dismiss them. Uh, he would, if he failed a second time at that point, he would assume that it wasn't a mistake, it was a pattern, and he'd get rid of people. But at the same time, there were people who served him well who more harsh commanders would have dismissed after an initial failure. So in this way, he was a better manager of personnel than most. It's a testament to his skills as an organizer that when the Ottoman Empire went to war and they had a mobilization time chart, that only his third corps was ready according to its allotted time. Third Corps was assigned to Gallipoli, and so he was one of the most important commanders in the early stages of the Gallipoli campaign. Due to the quality of the units that he had trained, many of the men who were assigned to Gallipoli ended up getting sent east prior to the British landing. So I think of the three divisions that he trained, two of them were gone by the time that the British came. His command at Gallipoli was actually separate from Lyman's. And, of course, because of that, he tends to get a lot less attention than Lyman von Sanders and Lyman's chief subordinate, Mustafa Kemal. Like Lyman, Mehmed Assad did not do a great job of responding to the initial landings. However, after that point, he did command competently, just like Lyman, and the Entente were unable to make any progress against his forces. In November 1915, he took over command of the First Army in place of Baron von der Goltz. In this position, he mostly trained new units before they were sent elsewhere, and he also did some tours of inspection. In late 1917, he visited Germany and then toured some of the German front lines to get a feel for how the most important ally of the Ottomans was doing. In February 1918, he returned and took up command of the Fifth Army, and later took up 3rd Army on the Caucasian Front in June. However, before he was able to mount any offensives with his new army, the Treaty of Mudros brought the war to an end. After the armistice, he was made inspector of the mostly defunct 2nd Army in the military schools, but basically thought he wasn't going to be used again in any meaningful capacity, so he retired in 1919. In 1920, there was a brief government under the uh, leadership of Halusi Salih Pasha, and he briefly came out of retirement to be Navy Minister, but that didn't last long. He went back to retirement. He wrote two memoirs which weren't published, one on the Balkan Wars, the other one on Gallipoli, and at a date that I apparently didn't write down, he died. To the best of my knowledge, he had no real role in the War for Independence. So to me, Mehmed Assad... He's a fairly skilled commander, very good organizer. Uh, as a theoretician of war, he caught on to things before most. But he was never given a position to really thrive. He never had the chance to really gain great glory. And while he did a good job at Gallipoli, he was outshone by 
the commanders facing the British. I believe that the, the landing that he contained was the French landing, which was much, much smaller. So anyway, Mehmed Assad, I would rank as a B. Pretty good, but didn't really have a chance to show exactly what he's made of. And partly it's because Enver Pasha liked to try to hold back people. And we'll see that consistently with these sort of lesser Ottoman generals, that Enver did not want any other Turk to win greater glory than himself. Next up we have Ahmed Izzet Pasha. He was the son of a prominent Albanian civil servant. He was born in 1864, meaning he's actually on the older end for an Ottoman general. He attended the military college between 1887 and 1890. He was a student of Baron Vonderdolz. He did well in the Greco-Turkish War and made the rank of colonel, which, as I mentioned, is much more senior in the Ottoman army than it is in any Western army. After the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, he became chief of staff of the army, but lost that position when he ran afoul of Prime Minister Mahmoud Shevket Pasha's policy against the Albanian Revolt of 1910. In 1911, having been dismissed as chief of staff, he was sent to Yemen, where he put down a different revolt. During the Second Balkan War, he commanded an army that recaptured Adrianople, or as the Turks renamed it, Adirni. In 1916, he took over command of the Second Army, which was assigned to the Caucasus alongside the Third Army. This was basically to reinforce the army that Enver Pasha had destroyed through his stupidity. The Ottoman plan was to use both armies to strike the Russians, but the Russians hit first. Third Army was really chewed up, and then the Second Army moved up to try to take its place, and it also took a bad beating, losing about 30,000 men. Uh, despite having a number of Gallipoli veterans, he was not able to really achieve anything against the Russians. And his third and fourth corps, or excuse me, yeah, third and fourth corps took bad losses. The only corps that did well was Mustafa Kemal's 16th corps. In general, um, Ahmed Izzet's handling of the Caucasus campaign has been viewed as poor. He was a friend of Mustafa Kemal, who then took over command of Second Army when Ahmed Izzet took over overall command of the two armies as an army group commander. In June 1918, he became the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and then he picked up uh, another position as war as the war wound to a close. On October uh, October 14th of 1918, he also became War Minister and Grand Vizier, becoming one of the last Ottoman Grand Viziers in a history that stretched for six plus centuries. Unfortunately for him, he was pretty much sick with the Spanish flu the entire time that he was vizier, so he didn't really do anything for the two or three weeks he was in office because he was bedridden. By the time that he recovered, he ended up being dismissed from office, and the most notable event of his time in office, the thing that makes him usually considered to be a failure, is that the government wanted to capture and hand over the three triumvirs of the Ottoman government. But because their Grand Vizier was bedridden with the flu, that did not happen. And so the three men escaped to Germany. And of course, they went their separate ways from there with, uh, you know, as we mentioned, Jamal ended up in Afghanistan and uh, Enver ended up in Russia and later trying to found a breakaway republic. For the most part, um, Ahmed Izzet is remembered pretty favorably today, and a lot of that does owe to his relationship with Kamal Mustafa. It basically, if you were a friend of Ataturk, that put you in good stead, and that meant that you were going to be portrayed positively. If you weren't on good terms with Mustafa, then you most likely would be portrayed very negatively. Um, Ahmed Izzet lived in Istanbul until his death in 1937. To me, uh, the fact that he has a positive reputation owes almost entirely to his friendship with Mustafa. If I'm basing it on his military performance, I have to go with an E. I could see a case for about a D. I think he's somewhere between a D and an E. I'm going to go with a D, an E for 
him, though, because I just don't think that he contributed all that much, and he does not seem to have had all that much ability. Next up, we have Hassan Izzet Pasha. He was born in Istanbul in 1871, and he graduated from the Military Academy in 1890, and then Staff College immediately afterwards in 1893. He fought the Greeks and then taught tactics at the War Academy, which means he must have been a pretty top-notch student to be asked to do that. He commanded the division during the First Balkan War, and later took up one of the corps under Ahmed Izzet's army during the Second Balkan War. Hassan Izzet was the commander of the Third Army facing the Russians when the war broke out. His plan was to draw the Russians in, fight a defensive action at the Erzurum Fortress, and then counterattack. He did not want to fight during the winter. He thought this would be disastrous. So when he shared his plans with Enver Pasha right after the Empire ended the war, um, Enver said, well, that's all fine and well, but what we're really going to do is follow my plan and attack the Russians first in the middle of winter when they're not expecting it, uh, and seize one of their cities, knock them into disarray. Maybe knock them out of the war by completely demoralizing them. Hassan Izzet effectively said, I'm not doing that. That's fucking stupid. This plan makes me nervous. I don't feel like I can pull that off. Actually, that's what he said. He said, I don't think I can do this. And he was trying to play humble, but Enver who again at this time did identify as a military genius, said, well, I know it's a tall task for an average man, but a military genius such as me, well, it's just another day. So you're relieved. I will take command and show you how it's done. Uh, of course, the battle became Sarakamish, and it was a complete catastrophe. Now, Enver was somewhat chastened by his disaster, and he began to behave a little bit more modestly. But one thing that he never did was forgive Hassan Izzet for correctly predicting that his plan would fail. So Hassan Izzet actually formally retired in August 1915 while the war was still going on. This is a guy who, again, had been one of the top generals. He had plenty of experience that was recent, and there was every reason to expect that he could have done well. But because he w had made a, a dire enemy of Enver Pasha, well, he was never going to get a command, so he had to sit out the rest of the war. He lived until 1931. I find his son Izzet Pasha to be unrankable, so I'm not going to put him on the board. But he is an army commander, and I think he's an interesting fellow. He's another guy who had things gone slightly different, or had, say, that Armenian soldier not rescued in Pasha, then perhaps he would have gone down as someone who commanded armies in the field for the empire, but that is not how things played out. Next up, we have Mahmoud Kamil Pasha. Let me check something real fast to see how things are going over here. Um... Okay, let's see. Nicholas, something about El Gabalus, I'm sure. Uh, $2 Canadian, he says... Uh, shit. shit. Brother Sean is an oxymoron. Sean is not a brother. Not a brother of El Gabalus. Zach Gilliam, uh, another one for five dollars. Thank you, Zach. He says, "For y'all, you're doing God's work. The truth will make us all free. War is hell. I love you all and embrace you all." Well, thank you, Zach. Uh, war is hell, and I think that it's something that we should strive to prevent and end as much as possible. Um, as part of why we talk about this kind of stuff is to make it clear that these are all things that, while they're interesting to talk about, none of these things should ever be regarded as positive or good. Um, these are very much horrific events. All right, so Mahmoud Kamil Pasha. This guy. Who looks a little bit like Puero. At least in this picture at this size. If you pull it up, he doesn't look like Puero, but, you know. All right. So, 
He took command of the Third Army in February 1915, and he lasted for a year in that office before he was sacked in February 1916. The Russians took Erzurum. The Russians, of course, had amassed a considerable edge in both manpower and artillery, and they struck at a time when Mahmoud Kamil was still in Istanbul, and his German chief of staff was in Germany visiting his family. The German attack, or Russian attack began on January 10th, and Mahmoud Kamil was not present to command in person until January 29th. Ouch. By that point, many of the positions the Russians needed to take prior to taking Erzurum had already fallen. As we mentioned, Erzurum was the major Ottoman center in the Caucasus. It was a fortified city. It was sort of their forward base. Um, it was well fortified and it had a large number of guns, but because the Russians had achieved surprise, this meant that it was going to fall. Mahmoud Kamil was able to get most of his men out, but the defense was not sufficiently strong to make the Russians lose many men. The Ottomans did lose 10,000 killed and wounded. The Russians got nine standards, 5,000 prisoners, and 327 artillery pieces when they took the city. So this was a major disaster by anyone's reckoning. The Russians, on their end, only lost 1,000 men killed, 4,000 wounded with another 4,000 men going down due to frostbite. So while this Russian winter attack was much more competent than the one that the Ottomans mounted against them the year before, it still shows the dangers of a winter offensive. Let's say if Mahmoud Kamil had been in position to defend from the beginning, this might have gone much differently. But he didn't think that anyone would dare mount a winter offensive given what had happened to Enver Pasha. Um, and even still, with the Ottomans being caught out of position and everything else, 4,000 Russians suffered from frostbite. The fall of Erzurum kind of destroyed the good vibe that had been created by the uh, victory at Gallipoli. So the Ottomans went from being, went from having a very high morale to being in the doldrums once again, or at least being more mixed. This led to Mahmoud Kamil being replaced by Vahit Pasha. He held no other commands after this. After the war ended, the British arrested him and sent him to Malta with many of the other senior officials who were then uh, questioned about various things and put on trial. Uh, he was, of course, accused of being in the Armenian Genocide. It does not appear that the British made much of a case against him. He got traded for a British POW and so went back to Istanbul. And he then died fairly young in June 1922. And you'll notice I don't have as much biographical information about him. I was not able to find as much. So that's why his story begins when he takes the army command and you know, pretty much ends there. To me, Mahmoud Kamil is an E. I can't quite give him an F because uh, he didn't oversee this disaster in person. But based on what we saw, this was a very poor handling. It was a disaster. But he did stabilize the situation once he arrived, so he must have had a little bit of ability. So I can't quite go with an F, but certainly an E seems fitting given his performance. Next up we have Vahib or Vahib, also known as Wahib, Pasha. He is the much younger brother of the aforementioned Mehmed Assad. So he's pictured right here. He was born in 1877, meaning that he's a full 15 years younger than his brother, and he had a long and varied career as a senior commander during the war. So he got many more opportunities than his brother, despite, if we're being honest about it, being less talented. He was also from an Albanian family in northern Greece, just so the same biographical details apply as apply to his brother, but it does not appear that he ever struggled with Ottoman Turkish, perhaps his brother's experience uh, made, made his uh, family give him better instruction in Ottoman Turkish before he tried to go into the military. He graduated from the Imperial School for Engineering in 1899 and then went to war college, or military college. He served in Yemen with the 4th Army, but only rose to prominence because in 1909 he was a member of the CUP when they came to power. He was promoted to major immediately just because of his political affiliations. 
and he became the head of the cadet school at around that time. During the First Balkan War, he served under the command of his older brother at Yanya, fighting against the Greeks. Fahib was then entrusted with overseeing the official surrender when they had to surrender to the Greeks. He also served as a POW alongside of his brother. It's unclear if he stayed the whole time, though, but when he was released, he was promoted to colonel and then deployed to Arabia. Later on, he came back, and by the time of the Gallipoli campaign, he was assigned to that campaign. He was given command of 15th Corps, and then later took over the 2nd Army. In his capacity as an army commander at Gallipoli, he butted heads with one of his subordinates, the corps commander, Kamal Mustafa, Ataturk. This led the two men to develop a deadly hatred of one another, comparable to the hatred between Enver and Ataturk. Having done well at Gallipoli, he then was sent to take over from the ill-starred Ill -star Third Army in the Caucasus. So this is a case where both men, both Vahib and Ataturk, were pretty able. Now, Vahib is not on Ataturk's level, but he's still not a complete moron. The two of them just didn't get along. And one thing about Ataturk is the man was completely ruthless. So if someone was his enemy, he made sure that they paid the penalty for it. He might not kill them, but he would make sure that their opportunities were going to be very limited. Um, as he took over Third Army, he mounted a competent defense at first, but then suffered a defeat at the hands of the Russians at Erzinjan in February 1916. His army got wrecked. He lost 34,000 men, including 17,000 prisoners. The Third Army was out of commission for basically the remainder of 1916 and would not be usable again until the next year. Uh, this defeat confirmed that Erzurum and Trabzon would remain part of, uh, would remain in Russian hands indefinitely, because this was part of a counterattack after the fall of these uh, key positions, and of course the counterattack failed miserably. His forces weren't able to really do much more. Oh, excuse me, wait. So this repulse of Vahid Pasha and the Third Army represents, I would say, the zenith of Russia's war effort in the south. This is when they have done the most damage to the Turks and when the Ottomans are at their lowest ebb. Not much happened on his front in 1917, but in 1918, Vahid Pasha was able to retake Trabzon and the city of Hopa in modern Turkey and then pushed into Georgia to take Batumi in late March. He wasn't able to get much farther than that, and he remained in command of Third Army until the Armistice of Mudros, and then he returned to Istanbul. He had no part in the War of Independence because, again, the guy in charge of that was Ataturk, who did not like Vahib. Um, and actually, when he first came back to the capital, he was jailed, most likely due to the British but it could have been one of his other opponents as well. He went into exile for a while. He visited Greece, Romania, Italy, Egypt. And the root of his problem for the rest of his life is that he was a bitter enemy of Kemal Mustafa, and that meant that he would not be welcome in the new Republic of Turkey. He won't go back home until 1940, when Ataturk has been dead for two years. And in fact, things were so bad between the two men that while he was in exile, Ataturk had his citizenship revoked. So basically, the new government after Ataturk's death would soften their stance on him and allow him back in and allow him to be a citizen. In 1936, he volunteered as effectively a mercenary for the Abyssinians, where he uh, partook in the Second Italo-Abyssinian War and he served as chief of staff to Raz Nasabu on the southern front, and he used his engineering skills to oversee the construction of a fortification he called the Hindenburg Wall. But this wall failed utterly, and Vahib was a little bit embarrassed, and so he departed from Ethiopia soon after his fortification fell, 
Once he got back to Istanbul in 1940, he actually died not long after that. There's a good chance that the reason the government let him back in is because he made it clear that he was not long for this world. So he did get to die in his homeland, but only at the last minute. And uh, it's a fairly disappointing end for him, I suppose. To me, Vahib Pasha was a fairly mixed bag. Um, he had his successes, he had his failures. He doesn't seem to have been all that talented, but at the same time we have to remember that his army was not as powerful as the armies that he faced. So there's only so much you can ask. And when he was helping the Ethiopians, he was helping them against an enemy that was much more powerful, the Italians. So there's only so much he could achieve. I'll be kind to him and give him a C. Uh, Zach Gilliam, $2. In game is a rock is a fake nation. Curd screwed. Huh. Let's see, Zach for a dollar. Uh, okay. I think we're caught up then. I'm starting to lose steam too, just like Sean did. So I'll have to try to keep up with the super chats as best I can. It's kind of hard to manage everything right now. Alright. Next up we have Mustafa. Fezzi Pasha. Fezzi earned most of his fame as an administrator during the late Ottoman and early independent Turkish governments. Before that, he was a ranking Ottoman field commander. So if you look at the sort of brief summary of his career, it will focus more on his administrative work. Um, and not too much on his military career. But his military career is important. Alongside of Ataturk, Fez, uh, Fevzi would be one of only two Turks to ever achieve the rank of field marshal. He was born in what was then an outlying, uh, sort of a suburb of Istanbul, what is now part of the city, in 1876. His father was an artillery officer, and so young Fevzi traveled with his father and grew up along the coast of the Black Sea. He attended a military school at Thessaloniki, and he also received personal tutoring from his grandfather, who was a well-known intellectual in the Ottoman world. So he had a first flight education, and he was very well connected. His grandfather made sure to knew Arabic and Farsi, two languages that would come in handy for any Ottoman officer. He attended war college after a brief stint as a lieutenant of the infantry. When he became a staff officer with a division command in the Balkans, he taught himself to read Serbian, Bulgarian, and Albanian so that he could uh, study foreign newspapers to gather intelligence for the army. Fevzi also had two younger brothers who became officers, but one died during the First Balkan War, and the other one was KIA at Gallipoli. By 1907, he was a colonel, but during the um, sort of the law for the purge military ranks in 1909, he was busted down the major. But again, Major actually was fairly senior, and in fact, uh, Major was the minimum rank required to get the title Pasha, although um, it was not guaranteed or automatic, as we saw, because there was one guy who was pretty senior before he got it, but you could be as junior as a Major and become a Pasha. So Febzi probably had strong links to the CUP. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I assume that is the case. Before it took power, he became the chief of operations for the Vardar army during the First Balkan War, and effectively he blamed the army's poor performance on a lack of heavy equipment and the excessive spreading out of the command. He believed in the concentration of forces. He commanded two divisions in Anatolia during the Second Balkan War, so he was not directly involved in action, but he was sort of leading a reserve. And then he commanded the 5th Corps prior to the outbreak of World War I. This corps would later be sent to Gallipoli. In late 1915, he was sent to the east, first as a corps commander, but then as the commander of 2nd Army. We already know how that went. It was not great. Uh, this is where they try to get the jump on the Russians, and instead... 
losers are them. In October 1917, he took up command of 7th Army under the overall direction of Falkenhayn. This command structure was pretty convoluted, as Falkenhayn made Thebzi a sector commander at Beersheba, but then countermanded his order the same day and put Thebzi under the direction of Kress von Kressenstein, who was technically in charge of a different formation. In February 1918, he wrote to Falkenhayn to complain about communications and the poor state of his men's training because due partly to the Armenian genocide, partly due to Arab activity, and partly just due to the Ottomans not being well set up, uh, he could not send his men to the rear to rest and do training. His men were all along the front, they were getting tired, and they weren't able to really learn new things, so morale was pretty poor. Uh, but Falkenhayn did not really do much to relieve that problem. In August, Febzi fell ill, and so he had to abandon his post and return to Istanbul to recover. On December 24th, with the war now over, he became the Army Chief of Staff, and he was the guy who created the position of Army Inspector. The purpose of this was to prepare the Turkish Army, well, still the Ottoman Army technically, for a Greek invasion which was expected, and indeed did it materialize. He later became Minister of War and Acting Prime Minister, before being condemned after he went to Ankara to side with the Nationalists. Febzi had a hand in founding a Turkish Communist Party around this time, but this was a Communist Party that was loyal to Kemal Mustafa, and the purpose of it was simply to drain support from the Communist Party of Turkey, which was the real Communist Party. So, he's not a Communist, he just played one in order to help his political ally Kemal Mustafa, and undermine potential opposition. But that would not be the last time he'd actually found a political party. During the War of Independence, he got back in the field command, and it was here that he did his most important work by a long shot. He became a field marshal alongside of Ataturk prior to the final campaign in 1922. The two of them swept up the remaining Greek forces, secured the coast, and finished the war. Um, despite his stature as one of the greatest war heroes, and then also becoming one of only two field marshals, and becoming the very first Turkish chief of the general staff, uh, he actually retired pretty early after the uh, War of Independence, and abandoned public life altogether. So he left his position as chief of the general staff of the Turkish army in 1924, and by the end of the year had also left his seat in Parliament. They continued to be outspoken, but he was not someone who held office or appeared on the regular. Um, one of the things that he really opposed that Ataturk did was trying to keep the Kurds down. Ataturk deprived the Kurds of political influence. Uh, Febzi was not a big fan of that. That might have led to his resignation since Ataturk was in many ways the dictator after the war, or at least his prestige was such that opposing him was just not going to work. Um, Ataturk died in 1938, and Febzi was seen as the front-runner to become the new president just because of his prestige. But while he easily could have had the job if he just asked for it, he decided he didn't want it, and so he declined and instead backed a man who did want it, Ismet Anunu who then became Turkey's second president. Interestingly enough, just like Anunu, Febzi would die in 1950. So, to me, uh, Febzi, based on his World War I performance, is a C. If we factor in his war for independence, obviously he goes much higher. We factor in his work as an administrator, obviously he goes a lot higher. But that work all came after World War I, so it doesn't count for this list. Also, vaguely in this picture, he looks a little bit like Bob Odenkirk. Bob Odenkirk is Mustafa Febzi Pasha in The Turkish War for Independence, now streaming on Netflix. Alright, um...
Let's see. Is that Gilliam? Balkans are pre-game World War One. Balkan Wars. That's true. They are. Uh, Zach Gilliam, $2. Thank you, sir. Turkey was the U.S. missile base versus Russia. Yes, it was. The Turks did get involved pretty heavily in the Cold War because they feared Russia. And a lot of that is because there is a very long-standing rivalry between first the Ottomans and Russians, and then, of course, the Turks, who are the primary inheritors of the Ottomans. So that was a hostile relationship from the outset. And... Turkey became a fairly natural U.S. ally during the Cold War for that reason. Okay. Now we move on to our next commander, Nuruddin Pasha, better known as Bearded Nuruddin. And that's what I'm going to call him because it's a more distinctive name. So Bearded Nuruddin was born in 1873 and the reason why he had this nickname, despite the fact that his beard wasn't as big as, say, uh, Jamal's, is because it was to distinguish him from a Grand Vizier from the 1880s, Abdurrahman Nuruddin Pasha. Um, now, I guess for men of that generation, perhaps that Vizier was still memorable, or he must have been. So that's why they called him Bearded Nuruddin, rather than just Nuruddin Pasha. Nuruddin was not a very good student at the academy. Now, most of the guys we've talked about did very well academically, including even Enver Pasha, but Bearded Nuruddin, not so much. And also, he is one of the very few flag officers in the Ottoman army who did not attend staff college, or is it sometimes translated war college. Um, this was becoming standard by World War I, but most armies didn't take it super seriously. In fact, the British saw it as somewhat of a joke, at least a lot of them did, as we'll see when we get to them in March or April. Well, we're already in March, you know what I mean. Um, but the Ottomans certainly did take War College seriously, so the fact that Bearded Nuruddin commanded an army without going is very unusual and was definitely the exception to the rule. However... His father was a high-ranking officer, so he was able to get choice assignments, and he had a lot of name recognition. He saw action as a junior officer in the Greco-Turkish War of 1897, and later on, when Abdul Hamid still had pull, he served as aide-de-camp. And we'll see when we look at other factions that serving as aide-de-camp to a monarch is a very cushy assignment, which really helps your career prospects. That was also true in Italy, where being aide-de-camp to Victor Emmanuel was very much a shot in the arm to your career. And in fact, uh, I mentioned earlier when I was talking with Sean, Eric von Falkenhayn became chief of staff after von Moltke because the Kaiser requested it. He knew Falkenhayn personally from Falkenhayn's time as aide-de-camp and demanded that Falkenhayn get the shot to be Chief of Staff. So, in some ways, Nuruddin Pasha would benefit in a similar manner from his father and from the Sultan, even though he technically, by the emerging standards of his time, was not qualified to command an army. The Young Turks recruited him in order to put pressure on his father because, uh, you know, bearded Nuruddin's dad would have been a huge get for them. And also, his dad was investigating the Young Turks, so the officer responsible for trying to ferret them out was the elder Nuruddin. I don't know if he had a beard or not. Um, bearded Nuruddin did receive a demotion, possibly due to his activity with the CUP, but also possibly just due to the uh, war against rank inflation. But then once the Young Turks took full control, he gained rapid promotion, and he became one of their key guys. He was a staff officer in the war against the Yemeni rebels, and he led an infantry regiment during the Second Balkan War. He was next assigned to the model force, which was working with Lyman von Sanders in the military mission, so he'd be the guy out there drilling men in the German manner and learning directly from Lyman. In April 1914, he took up command of 4th Division. 
In April 1915, the Iraq area commander committed suicide. And this was at a time when the arrival of Townsend's Mesopotamian Expeditionary Force was expected, so they needed a commander to go out there and take over, and Bearded Nuruddin was selected. This is also when Enver Pasha finally put aside his hostility to Baron von der Goltz and sent him as well. Bearded Nuruddin was the field commander responsible for the Battle of Tessaphon, where it was effectively an encounter between an Ottoman army and the advancing British army. They fought to a standstill despite the fact that the British army was superior. Um, it's unclear, once again, exactly how influential von der Goltz was. I've read conflicting things that either he was giving advice the whole time or that he only really arrived on the scene after the battle had already started. But at any rate, uh, Bearded Nuruddin won. And at that point, he and von der Goltz decided to pursue to Kut, where Townsend was re-arming himself. But at that time, before his army was able to reach Kut and do a siege, Bearded Nuruddin was recalled by Enver and replaced by a man named Halil Pasha. From late 1915 in the early 1916, Bearded Nuruddin was consigned to backwater commands, mostly core army and area commands, including a stint in southwest Anatolia where nothing was happening. I don't know exactly why Enver had it in for Bearded Nuruddin, but it must have been political since Nuruddin had literally done nothing wrong. And in fact, Tessaphon was technically a draw, but really a victory because the Ottomans were pretty worried about what might happen, and effectively the Battle of Tessaphon turned back the British. So it was actually an important victory which then got overshadowed by the great success at Kut. During the Turkish War of Independence, he was incredibly important, so his importance will increase massively once Enver is gone and no longer holding him back and keeping him in backwaters and pretending like he's incompetent. Um, the Greeks managed to get him relieved in the southwest by complaining to the government, uh, but by the time the war actually starts, he's back. He does a number of important things in this war. One thing is to put down a Kurdish uprising. He also expels the Greeks from Pontus in the north. At Smyrna, Bearded Nuruddin was responsible for handing over an Orthodox bishop to a Muslim mob, which made that bishop uh, Chrysostomos a Greek saint. So that's probably the thing he's best known for outside of Turkey, is uh, effectively martyring a Greek bishop. After the war, he entered politics, but he became unpopular when he opposed a law that was supported by Ataturk, and after that, he became accused of being a reactionary. In October 1927, Ataturk delivered his Nuttuk speech, where he claimed that Bearded Nuruddin was trying to take too much credit, and basically... He said that Bearded Nuruddin should not get any credit for Coot because he wasn't there. Now, he did make the decision to pursue, and he set that in motion, but because he didn't pull off the battle, basically Ataturk tried to remove all credit from Bearded Nuruddin. Uh, apparently, Bearded Nuruddin had a feud with Halil Pasha about who should get credit. But once he came out opposed a couple of Ataturk's policies, Ataturk went out and tried to discredit him and apparently did a pretty effective job. So Bearded Nuruddin lost a hell of a lot of standing and he ended up dying at home in 1932 at the age of about 58 or 59. And um, in 1980 there was a military coup in Turkey and as you might imagine these foundational figures from Turkey's foundation uh, that was a stupid phrase but as you all know, I'm tired and kind of sick. The foundational figures from the foundation. Uh, anyway, these founders of Turkey are political footballs for whatever faction is taking power or trying to take power. And so the, pa the uh, military junta tried to take advantage of Bearded Nuruddin and tried to show their link with Turkish history by relocating his remains to the National Cemetery 
on the grounds that he was one of the 50 people closest to Ataturk. And this happened, but the public was unimpressed. Or actually, no, it didn't happen. The public just said, man, who gives a shit about Bearded Nuradin? I don't know who he is. So the junta didn't do it. Bearded Nuradin was a talented commander, and he made major contributions during both the First World War and the War for Independence. But ultimately, he was marginalized by Enver Pasha, and then later on, after the war, his reputation was wrecked by Ataturk, even though the two of them had worked well together during the War for Independence. So, with Bearded Nuradin, my initial instinct was actually to give him an A, but based on comparisons with the other guys we talked about, I think a B is probably more in line with what he deserves. Um, I'm of the opinion that Tessafon, in its own way, was every bit as important as Coot. It actually set the stage, and I have no reason to think that Nuradin would not have been able to pull off what Hillel Pasha did. Um, I see no evidence that he was a lesser commander, just because he didn't go to war college. And also, he would have had the Baron von der Goltz there. So, uh, depending on what you think of the Baron's role, he would not have been disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis Halil Pasha. Now, had he wanted Coot also, he would be A tier, possibly S tier. And... Um, Again, we don't know exactly what he was capable of because he was deprived of the chance to fight at Coot or any other meaningful command for the rest of the war. And as we've seen, you can look at the people below him, uh, he was a better option than all those guys who kept getting commands. So, yeah. Talk about someone whose talent was wasted. Next up we have... Jamal Mersenli Pasha, better known as Lesser Jamal, to distinguish him from the Triumvir. He was born in 1875. He attended the academy from 1892 to 95, and then immediately went to staff college, graduating in 1898. So that actually was a standard thing to, at this period, starting in the 1890s, if you're a promising officer, you go straight from the war academy to staff college, so that way you're ready to command at a higher level early. So these guys basically do six years of college before they really serve a day in the army in the proper sense. Very different than more modern militaries where, at least in the U.S. Army, if you went to a war college or ROTC, you graduate, you're a lieutenant by the age of 22 or 23, and then you attend colleges later as you become more specialized. And usually the equivalent of staff college, I think, is something that you usually take on as... Is it a captain or a major? Maybe even a little later than that. So we're talking about people who are 30 to 35, give or take, maybe. So it's a very different method of preparation. And it really does set up the Ottomans fairly well to have such a young officer corps because they had all gained all this uh, advanced training very early in their careers. So after he graduated, he inspected railroads and took up a number of different commands. He became colonel by 1908 and taught at the academy. In 1912, he was part of a commission to oversee the fortification of some key European cities. Of course, that came too little too late because before he could really do all that much to better fortify Ottoman cities, the First Balkan War happened and the Ottomans were put on the defensive by the Bulgarians and the Romanians and the Greeks and lost pretty much everywhere. Um, he became the chief of staff of the Western Army, and then he led two divisions against during the First Balkan War. I'm not sure how well he did, really, but the First Balkan War, as I mentioned, was a disaster so all the way around, so it's hard to really gauge. When the Ottomans took uh, recaptured Adrianople during the Second Balkan War, he became the city commandant. Later on, when Kress von Kressenstein had an army, he commanded a corps under him. And he also failed to pull off an amphibious operation at one point due to lack of resources. So at one point, Kress asked him to 
make a landing, but he was not able to pull it out. The Ottomans, needless to say, had very, very limited naval capacity, especially in the Near East. What naval capacity they did have was very close to home. And even then, they weren't able to seriously contest the British and French at Gallipoli on the seas. They were basically forced to hold back the few ships they had. So, he finally becomes an army commander in January 1918. He took, he took command of the 4th Army, and he was tasked with holding the Ottoman rear against Arab rebels. Given the general state of disarray of the Ottoman military, Lesser Jamal did fairly well. His 4th Army became part of Lyman's Yildrum Army Group, along with the 7th Army of Mustafa Kemal and the 8th Army under uh, Kavat Kabanli. When the line collapsed, Lesser Kemal was forced to retreat through the territory he had ravaged earlier fighting rebels, and because of that, the local Arabs were savage, and they sought revenge. And not only were stray individuals killed, but also small detachments were ambushed and destroyed. Lyman ordered Lesser Jamal to hold Damascus, which seems to have been doable militarily, this is when, you know, the army group's in full retreat. But Enver Pasha countermanded the order and told 4th Army to fall back so we don't know if they could have held on to Damascus or not. After he abandoned Damascus, he was then recalled to Istanbul and replaced. After the armistice, he served as Minister of War before the Entente pressure forced him to step down in favor of his former colleague Kavat Kabanli. He was arrested by the British and sent to Malta, just like so many officers. Came home, served in Parliament. He was charged with complicity in an assassination attempt on Ataturk in 1926, but he was acquitted due to a lack of sufficient evidence. That is a good sign, however, that he most likely was a political opponent of Ataturk and was not a major player in Parliament since Ataturk, during his lifetime, was dominant. And even after his death, the memory of Ataturk is so dominant that everyone who's anyone in Turkish politics typically claims to be the true inheritor of Ataturk in some way. So, uh, Lesser Jamal is one of the people who really maybe was among the first to find that out. He lived until 1941, and he died at the city of Erzurum, which was recaptured from the Russians in the end at the age of 66. To me, Lesser Jamal is a C. He did okay, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of it was that he was commanding a force that was in disarray, the possibilities were pretty limited, and when he did have a chance to hold, hold on to Damascus and win a great victory for the Ottomans, the commander-in-chief dropped in from the sky and prevented that from happening. So, I can't really judge him too harshly. And I feel that way with a lot of these guys. It's very hard to really get a sense of exactly how good or bad they were because of the influence of Enver Pasha and how he really tried his best to prevent any of these guys from succeeding too much and also made a lot of bad decisions that uh, not only undermine the war effort, but also really um, would shape the careers of these men in ways that were negative. We check the chats. All right, still good here. All right, next up we have Yakob Shevki Pasha. Or, excuse me, Yakob Shevki Pasha. He was born in 1876. He commanded both the 9th and 2nd Armies late in the war. He graduated from the Academy in 1900. His career then proceeded pretty quickly after getting off to somewhat of a slow start. During the First Balkan War, he was on the staff of 2nd Army, and during the Second Balkan War, he commanded the artillery at one of the Ottoman fortresses in Europe. When World War I broke out, he was in command of the fortified zone of Istanbul. He was then reassigned to command the 19th Division at Gallipoli, 
before ascending the command of the 13th Corps, or excuse me, 3rd Corps. His units played a major role at Gallipoli. He did pretty well there. When Enver Pasha sent a unit to Galicia in order to represent the Ottomans in the, around the Austrians and Germans, the commander that he selected was Jakob Shevsky. And part of the reason for this is because Jakob Shevsky was fluent in eight languages. So he's probably the greatest linguist of the men we'll discuss. He knew French, English, German, Russian, Persian, Arabic, Kurdish, and Serbo-Croat. So between knowing German and Serbo-Croat, he was very well positioned to represent the Ottomans with their German and Austrian allies. He did well in that role, and he earned a promotion to general. He made a pretty positive impression on the Central Powers. In 1917, he took command of Second Army, but before he could really do much there, he took command of the Ninth Army, which was in Azerbaijan and Georgia. The British arrested him and kept him on Malta until 1921. Once he returned, he joined the Turkish War of Independence as one of the key generals of Ataturk. In 1924, he was named to the Supreme War Council. He lived in Istanbul until his death in 1939. So, to me... Shevki Pasha is an interesting guy. I think it's fascinating that he could speak eight languages. But he didn't really have a lot of opportunities to shine as an army commander. Partly just because the Ottoman war effort by this point was so shot. Um, there were commanders, however, who did win some distinction in this period. Perhaps he just didn't get the priority or supplies. I have to go with a C for him. I feel like he was pretty average overall. Now, had he gotten more opportunities, then perhaps things would have gone differently. But as things stand, it's very hard to say. Next up we have Hafiz Haki Pasha. This man was very well connected politically and got more opportunities than he deserved. Hafiz Haki was a classmate of Enver Pasha. They were uh, he was born in 1878, which means he was very close in age to Enver. In addition to that friendship, he also was a really top-rate student. In fact, he graduated second from the academy and then went on to be first at war college. So he is considered to be one of the rising intellectuals in the army. He was an early stalwart of the CUP, and he became one of the freedom heroes or officers of liberation or whatever they were called in 1908. So one of the guys who really became one of the faces of the CUP, one of the young conquering heroes that was going to save the empire. During the Balkan Wars, Hafiz wrote a book on how armies ought to be led based on the hard lessons of the two Balkan Wars. It's unclear exactly how much that was ever implemented, however. During the Sarakamish campaign, he was entrusted with the command of 10th Corps on the left flank, and he had 40,000 men. He was in support distance of the 11th Corps, which was sort of in the middle. Or, excuse me, the 9th Corps was in the middle. Whereas, uh, there was a big distance between the 9th and 11th Corps. 11th Corps was isolated on the right. So, in many ways, you could argue that Hafiz Haki had the easiest job during the Sarakamish campaign. And, in fact, uh, one of the chief concerns that Hassan Izzet had raised with Enver was precisely that his corps on the right, the 11th, would get chewed up without mutual support. But in the event, what ended up happening is that actually the 10th and 9th Corps got bogged down, largely due to just the extremely poor planning of the operation in general. But also, it does appear that Hafiz Haki did not do a very good job with 10th Corps. Uh, keeping it up, keeping it supplied deploying it, anything like that. And in fact, it would be that isolated core on the right which would extricate the remnants of the two frozen core and allow some survivors to make it back. Um, so, just to give you a sense of how well Hafiz Haki didn't do in this campaign, of his 40,000 man command, at one point when they were at the gates of Sarakamish and still fighting the Russians, 
he had fewer than a thousand effectives. Let me repeat that. Even before the campaign was over, when his core was still, in theory, advancing on Sarakamish, he has 1,000 effectives out of his 40,000 man initial command. So if you need any number to show you exactly how bad of an idea the entire Sarakamish campaign is, I think that number should really stand out. So, um, in his official report after the battle, Hafiz Haki would list the total Ottoman losses for all three corps at 30,000 men. Which is actually, to be fair, about the number that the Russians lost. Because while this is a huge victory for the Russians, an unqualified success, they still lost a lot of men due to the elements and also just, uh, well, mostly the elements. The Ottoman army was pretty much shattered by the cold before the Russians got to them. Uh, so this is obviously a false number. The real number for the Ottoman casualties is about 110,000 men out of about 120,000 initially. So absolutely catastrophic losses. And this is one of the absolute worst winter campaigns ever. I would say that proportionally it is much worse than Napoleon's invasion of Russia, which lasted for quite a bit longer. So, yeah, keep that in mind. When Enver left for Istanbul, he turned to his old classmate and friend, Hafiz Haki, to take over command at Erzurum and piece the army back together. However, just a few weeks after assuming command of the shattered army, Hafiz Haki died suddenly of typhus. I assume that his health might have been compromised by exposure to the extreme cold, but I don't know. Obviously, he was not an old man at this time. He was still been in his 30s. Uh, typhus outbreaks did happen. They weren't that common, though. So this is a very unfortunate loss. Despite his poor performance at core level, his academic career, and then also the fact that he would get a lot of chances to learn because Enver Pasha was a good friend of his, means that I think he actually could have become a good commander. I don't know. I mean, there's no way to know, but I think he had potential. The problem is that he never got to develop it, and so he just... Uh, we have to judge him on what he did do. And what he did do is not very impressive. Now, a lot of it's not his fault, but his core was absolutely obliterated. So based on his performance, and also the fact that he filed a false report, I'm going to give him a D. Um, I feel like had he been an overall command rather than Enver, things would have gone better, just because he might have been smart enough not to try the winter offensive. But, uh, yeah, this was a disaster, and he had a hand in it. He could have protested the Enver more vigorously, Assuming that he saw a problem with the operation, which maybe he didn't. It's hard to say. So, I'll give him a D and move on. A D, not the D. Not really into necrophilia, especially not with men. Okay. Mandatory necrophilia joke of the evening. I do on every stream. I actually don't, but it's okay. I only have one um, necrophilia joke I like to make because I do ancient history. Uh, I like to say that my approach to history is the same as a necrophiliac's approach to sex. The older and deader, the better. Yeah. That's a good fucking joke. So, Next time I do a job interview, I think I'm just going to try it. You know, swing for the fences. I feel like that's one of those things where you either strike out completely or somebody likes your sense of humor and then you just uh, you get forward to the front of the line. I mean, it's a low chance that happens, but I feel like that is one of those swing for the fences kind of lines. It's either going to play out brilliantly in a handful of situations or people are just going to give you a really weird look and think you're a total fucking freak. Anyway. All right, next up we have Halil Pasha, who came up earlier. 
and we talked about uh, him taking over at Coot from the unfortunate Bearded Nuredin. So Halil Pasha was also referred to as Halil Coot because, not surprisingly, he wanted to take full credit for the victory at Coot. And as we know now, uh, Ataturk was completely on his side when it came to the credit quest. Almost certainly for political reasons after independence, which had nothing to do with the war itself, but whatever. Um, I was not able to find as much about him personally, but I do know that he graduated from the Staff College in 1905. During the Caucasus Campaign in late 1914, he was a division commander. Of course, just like everybody else, he was horrible, but I mean... That is mostly an Enver problem, more so than anybody else. Enver is responsible for that failure. Um, Halil had many connections with the High Command, and because of that, he was seen as Army Commander material. In 1916, he was drafted to replace Bearded Nuredin as a Rock Area Commander, and so he took over the Army as it was moving into position to lay siege to Townsend at Coot. And he would be the primary commander on the spot during the operation. Again, we don't know exactly how influential Baron von der Goltz was in terms of making decisions and providing timely advice. It's very hard to say. Um, not least because we are dealing with someone who's glory hungry. So, of course, uh, his account of this is that all of this operation was due to his own thinking and that the Baron did very little. Now, if you read a more German-slanted account, the assumption is always that anything good that the Ottomans achieved was solely due to the Germans and the German generals. So both accounts are pretty jaundiced, and I don't think we should take either of them too seriously. And we know that many of these Ottoman commanders were very intelligent men. It's not that they're incapable of understanding how war works. A lot of these guys are just as smart, if not smarter, than most of the generals will cover from other factions. They're just leading an army which is a lot less well-equipped. That's really what the difference boils down to. Um, okay. So, uh, during the Siege of Coot, it has sometimes been compared with Caesar's siege at Alicia, where he was laying siege to... Werfs and Jeterix's forces and then Gallic relief forces were trying to lay siege to him. So it's a very complex operation. The British launched three or so different relief columns. He manages to fend off all of them and then forced the surrender of Townsend. It's also worth mentioning that Halil initially initiated the siege with only 11,000 men, which I think was actually less than what Townsend had. And Townsend sort of panicked at first and sent his cavalry out of the way and sort of left his infantry stranded. So a lot of the disaster at Coot is less about Halil and the Baron, and a lot more about Charles Townsend being a very bad general. Um, there's also a lot of poor communication between Townsend and General Nixon, who was supposed to relieve him. They apparently did not plan together terribly well. But credit where credit's due, Coot was a huge victory for the Ottomans. And I think that it's safe to say this was the high watermark for the Ottoman war effort. This victory against the Mesopotamian Expeditionary Force. So at this point the Ottomans have a breather. But it's at this time that Enver and Talat and the others decide to use the breather in order to really fuck over the Armenians. So rather than focusing on training or anything like that, or storing supplies or resting, or they just start marching the Armenians around and trying to kill as many as possible. So, um, Halil is one of the guys who is the most complicit in the Armenian genocide. So we mentioned that not all of the generals were equally into this. Uh, one of the triumvirs himself was very, very critical of it. But Halil Pasha went wholeheartedly into the genocide. So, um, he never expressed any kind of remorse or regret. 
In his memoir, he boasted that he'd killed at least 300,000 Armenians due to his action. Meanwhile, he's still the 6th Army Commander, the Governor of Baghdad, and he would hold those positions well into 1918. 6th Army's morale and performance declined, however, because of their involvement in the Armenian Genocide and Hillel Pasha's obsession with such operations. He also um, was ordered by Enver Pasha, strategic genius, to send part of his command to northern Persia, where the idea was that it would undermine the British hold, either by inspiring local revolts or by uh, forcing the British to respond. It really did neither. And for those of you who know a little bit about Ottoman history, you know that Persia was never really part of the Ottoman Empire, and they didn't give a shit about becoming a part of the empire. So between that and uh, the Ottomans becoming much more hostile to minority populations, you can imagine why the Persians were not eager to switch sides. The effect of that was that Halil now had fewer men with whom to defend Mesopotamia and Baghdad. So he's in a worse position, and a lot of his attention is now going to killing Armenians rather than doing his job as army commander. So, because of the dilution of his army, he, in 1917, he failed to hold Baghdad, and his 6th Army was pushed back. They now were stationed in northern Iraq, and they held the line there. But apparently, he divided his command into about two parts, or at least his successor would. And a lot of his attention was still, where are the Armenians? Rather than, I need to make sure I can hold against the British. The British initially retained him on Malta in 1919-1920 for his role in the Armenian Genocide, but he escaped and made it to Moscow. His wanted status meant that he was a diplomatic liability, and for that reason, while the Turks were fighting the war for independence, they did not want him there, because otherwise it would be very hard to win sympathy from the British. So they kept him at arm's length as long as possible. When they had independence, they recalled him in 1923. It does not appear that he was used in many capacities in the Turkish Republic, but he was allowed to live there and to write his memoirs where he bragged about the Armenian Genocide, despite the fact, as we mentioned, that Ataturk tried to deny that it happened in the first place. Um, so if you're wondering why this guy got no positions, it's because of that. Um, he was not willing to tow the Ataturk line. He wanted to actually not only acknowledge the genocide, but really talk about it as an achievement. So completely the opposite of what Ataturk wanted to do. Um, he died in 1957, and apparently this was a controversial death because his last request was that someone would pour a bottle of Raqqa on his grave. Raqqa is the Turkish liquor. It's very good. Um but it's sort of their um, signature liquor. And apparently it was considered some sort of uh, impropriety to pour liquor on a grave. So this created a big stir in the newspapers and people were outraged. But I don't know if he got what he wanted or not. I'm sure eventually someone learned about that and did it for him. But uh, I don't think it happened at the time because of the outrage. So... Halil is very hard to judge because if we look at his early career at Kut, I mean, that's A-tier stuff, at least. Maybe even low-key S-tier. Defeating a British army, pulling off basically a reenactment of Alicia. But then the rest of his career is a damn near disaster. The guy gets so distracted by the Armenian Genocide that he forgets to do his job as an army commander and just becomes negligent. If we were looking at his command post-Kut, I mean, he's like an E or an F. So, because of that, I'm going to have to average him out as a C. Uh, very mixed commander. I guess, as Sean would say, he's very erratic. Very inconsistent. Um, and again, because of his overall performance, that's why I said earlier that I'm pretty confident that Bearded Nuruddin could have pulled off what he did at Kut. And even though it was one of the greatest victories of the war, I don't think it was the action of a military genius just based on everything else that we know about Halil and his career. And again, that's part of why I think a lot of the defeat owed more 
to Townsend being an idiot than it did to Hill being some kind of military genius. Alright, let's check the SCs real fast. Make sure we haven't fallen behind. Okay. Um, Alright. Cool. Next up we have... Nuri Pasha. Nuri Pasha is the half-brother of Enver Pasha. And he's the guy I mentioned earlier who is, to the best of my knowledge, the youngest flag officer, meaning army level commander of World War I, period. I don't know the exact number, but I think he technically becomes an army commander when he's 28 or 29. I could be a little off on that, but we'll talk about him. So, he only rises to prominence relatively late in the war. We'll discuss why he was sort of on a secondary theater for most of it. But although he does rise to prominence much later, he will have a much more respected position overall because, of course, Enver dies kind of in semi-disgrace and the guy was a total failure. Born in 1889, Nuri has to, I mean, like I said, has to be in the running for youngest army commander. So, yeah, he becomes an army commander in 1918. He was only 29 years old. So, there you go. Nuri was dispatched with a small staff and a large amount of gold on a hired Greek ship to Libya in 1915 when the war started. And his job there was to foment discontent against the British and take over where his brother had started. Now, I don't know if he had accompanied his brother to Libya a few years earlier for the Italo-Libyan War, Italo-Ottoman War, but uh, his job was to stir up local resentment and revolts against both the Italians and the British to pave the way for the reclamation of Libya, and also to destabilize the British hold in Egypt. So basically, Nuri Pasha was kind of doing Enver's work, because Enver anticipated great success early on, because once again, Enver genuinely thought he was a military genius, that he would lead the Ottomans to a swift victory against the Russians and British, and then get back to restoring the empire's uh, old vigor. So Nuri was effectively trapped by his brother's delusions in many ways. Although, as we'll see, it's possibly actually shared some of these, but uh, we'll get there. So, basically, he was kind of doing in Africa what Lord Byron was doing for the British government in Greece during the Greek War for Independence in 1821. Or, you know, the, the lead-up to 1821. So, um, it's unclear exactly how well this went. I didn't really find anything that indicated how much of a nuisance he was or wasn't. My suspicion is that this was a waste of 10,000 gold pieces that could have been better spent elsewhere. Um, the British did eventually crack down on Nuri and they sent troops in to chase him away. And that caused the Ottomans under Enver to reorganize. In 1917, this created the uh, they created the command called Africa Groups Command, which makes it sound way more important and impressive than it was, because this is basically Nuri and a small staff with some gold, just trying to stay hidden and trying to inspire revolt. Um, and he was the commander in the theater, despite being lieutenant colonel. And his task as the commander of Africa Groups was to reclaim the coast of Libya. Of course, he never does that or comes close. This was a fool's errand at best. Um, so anyway, I don't know if he ever achieved, aside from taking a few British troops out of the line for more important duties, again, I don't think this was a very efficient use of gold. While this was a massive failure, again, the blame goes for Enver because this was his dumbass idea that he kept pressing for and, uh, Nuri had no choice but to go along because his brother was the commander-in-chief. So, now we're in the 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution happens, Russia falls apart, exits the war, and now Enver will recall his brother from Africa, send him to the Caucasus, and order him to 
organize the so-called Islamic Army of the Caucasus, also sometimes just called the Army of Islam. The reason why it's called this is because Enver, at this point, was very jealous of the success that Germans had had, and he wanted to have an Ottoman army without a single German in it, which would then go on to victory to prove that the Ottomans did not need the Germans. And he entrusted his brother, age 29, with command of that army. So, um, Nuri will arrive in May and begin to really establish his army, uh, May of 1918, that is, and officially his army got it underway on July 10th. Now he was tasked with capturing Azerbaijan in the war's waning days. And this was a three-way struggle. There were Bolsheviks there. There was an Armenian group trying to take control. And then you have the Army of Islam under Nuri Pasha, which is by far the strongest of the three. Not surprisingly... Nuri Pasha is able to quickly send the other uh, factions packing, and by September 1918, he has control of Baku. After the war is over, he's arrested by the British. Uh, also, by the way, um, Kress von Kressenstein, when the war ended, he was preparing to fight Nuri Pasha, but uh, the war ending meant that he never got the chance. So, the war's over, he gets arrested by the British, sent to Malta, you know the drill, but uh, he never makes it to Malta because while he's on the coast waiting to be shipped out, his supporters rally, they kill the jailers, and Nuri goes free. He does return to Turkey and stay, though. It does not appear that he was a part of Enver's later adventures as a would-be pan-Turkist and later as you know the founder of some independent republic. So, he doesn't participate in that, so far as I'm aware. And he manages to live fairly quietly in the new Turkey. Now, most likely, he had to keep a low profile because he's the brother of a man whom Ataturk absolutely despised. So, he kept a low profile for years. And then, in 1938, Ataturk is dead. So now Nuri Pasha can emerge from hiding. By this point, he has a new surname because of the surname laws of 1933 or 4, whatever it was. I forgot to write down what his surname was. Oh, it's a Killigal. K-I-L-L-I-G-I-L. So anyway, the, the newly minted Nuri Killigal comes out of obscurity and purchases a factory in Istanbul and begins to manufacture war material to profit off of the coming conflict. Now, because Turkey wants to remain independent, people begin to worry that Nuri's arms dealing will get Turkey sucked in. So he basically just pretends that he's not making weapons anymore and that he came to public pressure, but secretly he is. And I'm not sure if the public pressure is from the government or just from the public, um, but it does appear that he was doing his own diplomacy and not really worrying too much about the official government. So he'd kind of gone rogue under Anunu. Nuri, um, one of the things he tried to do while talking with the Nazis is he tried to revive Enver's dream of pan-Turkism and tried to encourage them to recruit as many Turkic soldiers as they could and allow those soldiers to create their own units and ultimately to create republics that could join with the Turks to form a Grand Turkish Alliance, which would then be uh, some sort of ally to the Germans. The Germans weren't super into his idea, but they did allow for the creation of a unit from Turkestan in their uh, SS. One of his other ideas was to recognize the independence of Azerbaijan, he thought that an independent Azerbaijan would be beneficial to the Nazis. In reality, though, most likely the reason why he pushed for this is because he had developed a certain affinity for the people of Azerbaijan when he was stationed there as an army commander. The Nazis weren't going to do that. They wanted direct control of the oil at Baku. So, uh, for the most part, he failed when dealing with the Nazis, but that did not prevent him from trying, and apparently he met with their officials on many occasions both in Turkey and when he would travel to Germany. Um, after the war, 
1948 or 49, he was still running his munitions plant, and an explosion occurred where he and 28 of his workers were killed. And because of how badly his body was mutilated, Islamic custom does not really allow for funerals of badly mutilated corpses. So he was denied an official state funeral. But that changed in 2016. In 2016, he finally got a state funeral, and it was attended by both Turkish and Azerbaijani officials. So it was a big deal when it happened for the official class and for anybody who was a big fan of Ottoman and early Turkish history. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, this would have been one of those political stunts that the general public most likely saw as rather irrelevant. It'd be kind of like having a funeral for a random founding father and waiting until the 1850s to do it, or 1860s or 70s. It's kind of odd. But it happened, so he did get his funeral. It just took a really long time. Now, as for trying to rate Nuri Pasha, I'm inclined to give him a B because this was late in the war. Ottoman morale was dog shit, but yet he managed to get his army to invade, and while he was fighting inferior forces, he had to fight two of them, so he had to navigate some difficult political waters, and then secure an area that was not necessarily extremely friendly to anyone. So, I think he did well with the challenge he was given, but we didn't really get a good chance to assess his skills because he never got a chance to face off against Kress von Kressenstein who is also right here on the B tier as an Ottoman general as well. I think Kress proved himself much more than Nuri. So in many ways, Nuri, this is kind of like an honorary B rather than a full B. Next up, we have Ali Isan Pasha. He was born in 1882. He commanded the corps at Kut as a division commander and a corps commander, he was a vigorous proponent of the Armenian Genocide, telling the Germans, when they asked him, that he did not intend to allow a single Armenian to survive. So, basically, the Germans, despite not being super morally outraged by the Armenian Genocide, saw it as a waste of resources. And when they would try to convey that to the Ottomans, many of the generals would not listen and perhaps the guy who was the most gung-ho of them all about the Armenian Genocide was Ali Yassan. He only made it to Army Command. He he made it to 6th Army Command on June 30th, 1918. And this was, of course, in replace of Halil Pasha. So he will be the last Ottoman commander to try to defend Iraq. By the time that he took over the army, it was severely innervated due to a lack of replacements and the extremely poor job that his predecessor had done. However, like his predecessor, he is obsessed with the Armenian Genocide and not as concerned with dealing with the British. Perhaps he had a bad intelligence report that indicated that the British wouldn't be coming any further north. At any rate, he had divided his army into two, with one group watching the headwaters of the Tigris and the other group under him exterminating Armenians. So when a British force came up river, it caught one of the wings of his army completely by surprise and destroyed it at the Battle of Sharkat. He only found out after the battle was over and half his army was gone. And most likely because he was so caught up with trying to kill Armenians, he was not paying attention to the British and so could not really do anything. In one of his official proclamations, which was found and preserved by French archivist, Ali Hassan said that he had systematically killed all, all the Armenians he had encountered, including the women and children, in every area that he had occupied. Later, he was asked to meet with some Armenian officials, and it was over his role in the Armenian Genocide. And it was Ali Hassan who flippantly said, I had half a million of your co-religionists killed, massacred, excuse me. I can offer you a cup of tea. 
So this is a man who might be the biggest monster of all the Ottoman commanders on a moral level. In fact, I would say he might be worse than Talat, who at least thought on some level he was doing some positive good. This guy was just bloodthirsty. He just liked killing people. Um, if there were psychological exams at that period, there's no fucking way this guy would have been cleared to command an army. I mean, this guy is completely off the reservation mentally. Um, now we've got to assess him as an army commander, though. Oh, also, I guess one thing that does kind of exonerate him a little bit from his last defeat is that that defeat occurred a few days after the armistice of Mudros. So technically, the British were not supposed to be attacking when, when and where they were because the two sides had agreed to a ceasefire. So in some ways, the defeat that he suffered at Charcot should not have occurred. It's kind of like the World War I equivalent of the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. Nonetheless, uh, it did happen, and of course when he protested and asked the British to fall back to the position agreed upon in the treaty, they basically just ignored him. And so he couldn't do anything about it. I'm really not sure whether he gets an E or an F. I know it's one of those two, though. I mean, this guy sucked... But the question is, how much does he suck? Um, let's see. Do you guys got any thoughts? Um, what do you guys think about Ali Hassan Pasha? Is he an E or an F? I'll let the chat decide on this one because I'm pretty torn. Um, I'll come back in a second and see what you guys think. First of all, I'll do a Diogenes super chat for $10. Thank you, Diogenes. He said, hey, y'all, thoughts on the State of the Union and when's the Spanish Civil War discussion video coming out? Also, if Elagabalus was born in Byzantine era, would 90 or 100% of mankind be speaking Greek right now? Okay, so uh, I did not see the State of the Union yet. That's been something I've been meaning to do, but I've been pretty busy and, well, mostly just sick, so... I've not been as productive the last several days, starting on Thursday. I hope to catch it tomorrow to kind of get a feel for what happened. I know it was, there were a few parts people had problems with, other parts that I've heard actually get praised. I'll decide for myself when I see it. Spanish Civil War, I'm sure we'll do that. I don't know exactly when, though. It's not really, um, it's not on our immediate list of things to do, but it's definitely on the list. Uh, Elagabalus as a Byzantine Emperor, yeah, I mean, obviously his views would have really not worked among the Orthodox Christians of the Byzantine Empire, so I don't know how he'd have gotten anywhere near being Emperor, but if he had, I can only imagine the moralizing that would have gone into the sources. Um, shit. Um, I got to say, 100% of the world would speak Greek in honor of Elagabalus if he had been a Byzantine emperor, because I think it would just been a respect thing. Everybody, of course, would have converted to his religion. I think that's obvious. But also, Byzantine-era Greek would now be considered classical rather than classical Greek, just because uh, medieval Greek would have been the Greek of the time in which the holy anointed emperor took over and really made things happen. So we got a pretty mixed reaction to uh, Isan Pasha here. Half the people say E, the other half say F. Um, and yeah, losing half your army, that's auto E or F, I agree. That's, that's definitely something that I have been pretty big on. Um... I'm going to side with those of you who are going with F. Because, I, yeah, you guys are right. Um, logistically, that is something that army commanders are supposed to do. You're supposed to be able to keep control of your whole command, uh, supervise your entire area. That was what Iraq Area Command entailed. He did not do his job properly because he got sidetracked. So, uh, Ali Hassan Pasha is our second F of the evening. And as a fanatic, he will make an interesting addition to the F-tier tournament when that happens. And what I'm going to do for that is to uh, draw names out of a hat to make sure the brackets are completely random. 
And so I don't know who will actually make the cut for the 16 slots in the tournament, but uh, these two men are now eligible, both Enver Pasha and Mr. Genocide here, Mr. Cup of Tea. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's possible they'll even square off against one another. We'll see. Who knows who will be matched up against each other. It could be uh, Enver Pasha versus James Buchanan and uh, Ali Ishan versus uh, Ernst Busch, the German general who was responsible for Operation Bagradian, or being on the receiving end of Bagradian at least. So, could be some exciting matchups, some real heavy hitters out there really competing to see who is just a little bit less shitty. All right. And before anyone asks, I don't know when the F tier tournament will be. I'm still working out the details. I have found a site that enables me to use brackets, though. So um, I know how to do it. I just got to figure out when we want to do it. And I'm going to have to talk to Sean to uh, make sure that we have our complete pool of candidates, people we've discussed, and people we still have notes for, so we can really uh, make it work. We'll also have to create some competitions for them to engage in. So. I uh, look forward to that. Uh, I think that will be the most fun stream that we do. Actually, uh, I'm not impressed for that to be in April. Maybe late April. I mean, ideally, you'd want to do it on April 1st, but I don't think it's going to be ready by then, so tentatively think late April, maybe early May for the F-tier tournament. The tournament of non-champions. All right. Last is Kavat Kabanli. He was born in 1870 or 71. Apparently the exact circumstances of his birth are not entirely clear. He entered the academy in 1888, immediately went to Staff College, which again, as I said, was fairly standard, graduated in 1894. His father was very influential and was in a position of power in the government around 1900. For most of his career, Kavat was more of a of an ambassador who wore a uniform and did diplomacy than he was a military man. So in many ways, he's kind of a political general on a professional level. So someone who excels at representing the army to politicians and visiting with foreign dignitaries and uh, selling the Ottoman military to others. That's really what his specialty is. He briefly served as an adjutant to the Sultan, aide-de-camp, so, as I said earlier, that really helps your career in terms of fast-tracking. And if you'll recall, the other guy we talked about who served as adjutant to the Sultan also had a father who was very highly placed in the government. Hmm. It's almost as if the system was rigged to favor people whose dads could pull strings for them. Weird. Okay. So, uh, Kavat was someone who toured some earthquake zones to help people who were affected by that. He also was an attaché in France for most of the 1890s. Uh, before the law which reduced ranks, he was a general, and of course then he gets bumped down below general but quickly regains his rank. He headed the academy for a year, and then he represented his government at a German military parade and also accompanied the heir to the Ottoman throne during a visit to Berlin. So once again, this is a guy, or excuse me, London. So once again, this is a guy who was typically selected for being a diplomat. And this also means that unlike most of these other guys we talked about, who often are fairly difficult gentlemen, apparently he has some tact and he has a bit of um, reserve. So he has a skill set that most of these other guys do not have which makes him valuable. Now, he only really becomes a hero during the naval stage of the fighting at Gallipoli. As we mentioned, the Ottomans did not have the naval power to fight a real battle with the British and French. But Kavat became a hero by using mostly land-based forces and a few ships, and he managed to sink three battleships. I think two of them were woefully outdated, so we don't want to make too big of a deal of this. But still, if you think about the really shitty state of the Ottoman defenses and the Ottoman navy, this was still a massive achievement. And that led to him being promoted back to general. 
So actually, I forgot he actually wasn't really that much in favor until this point. And he also gets the title of Pasha for the first time. But the title that he had become most known for after this point was Hero of March 18th. Because basically he pulled off a military miracle. No one thought it was possible the Ottomans could hurt the British fleet. And he did it. And this is what bought the Ottomans so much time. Because initially the idea was that the, the Navy would blast its way through the Dardanelles, the Ottomans would be intimidated, and uh, maybe even the Gallipoli landings wouldn't be all that necessary, or they could open up the Straits and then they could try landing closer to Constantinople. But this really was a huge win for the Empire. It's not as celebrated today, but at the time people knew exactly what March 18th meant and who the hero of that day was. Much later on, and again, because he's a hero, guess who was jealous of him? That's right, Enver Pasha. So even though he proved to have some actual talent in the field and that he wasn't just a political guy, he was not given that many other opportunities because Enver Pasha was jealous. However, he eventually does take up command of 8th Army in the Yildrum Army Group. Kavat's forces will be stationed on the coast, and he had a general responsibility for holding the land to the west of the Sharia River. The main British blow fell on Kavat's army, and he was badly outnumbered and outgunned. His army was not able to hold its position, they got routed, and Kavat escaped only by jumping in the river along with some of his companions and swimming to safety. After the armistice, he served as Minister of War, and in a couple of other positions here and there. He had to choose between political and military office after the war, as it was no longer acceptable for officers who were currently serving to be members of parliament, so he decided to leave parliament and then finish his career in the army. So kind of a surprising choice given what he was famous for. And his most notable deeds were diplomatic from here on out. There were some border crises over the borders in Egypt and Iraq, and because the Ottomans had information about where the borders were, they did dispatch a, di a diplomat to uh, advise, and the guy they chose was Kavat Kabanli. Um, the highlight of his career was the Geneva Convention, where, of course, he represented Turkey, and war crimes were... I think really for the first time, fully defined in a clear way. Because remember, part of the reason why the British at Malta couldn't really do anything to the Ottomans they arrested is because there wasn't really a precedent in international law for pursuing justice in that way. So the British couldn't string up these men they knew were guilty of murder because the, the men had not killed British subjects. So the British kind of had to let it go in the end. But had the convention, had the uh, Nuremberg Conventions already been in place, or excuse me, Geneva Convention already been in place, then a lot of those guys at Malta would have been tried and hanged for what they had done. He retired very soon after Geneva in 1935, so the same year, if I'm not mistaken, and he passed away in 1938, the same year as Ataturk. He was actually buried next to Ataturk, and he is regarded as a national hero. So, the naval battle at the Dardanelles was a huge victory, and that would seem to make him an A, but we also have to factor in, hell, maybe even S, um, but then we have to factor in his time with 8th Army. Um, I'm not sure when he took command of 8th Army, though. It could have been after everything was completely fucked. I don't know. Because I was thinking B, but I don't know exactly how responsible he was for 8th Army's performance, just because things were falling apart at that time. I'm going to err on the side of generosity and give him an A, though. And I think also his diplomatic efforts do deserve some credit. Because there weren't many guys on this list here who could be diplomats. Most of these guys were assholes, as we've seen, in many ways. Uh, not only did they have a lot of feuds with one another, but many of them were petty and jealous, especially Enver, looking at you. Uh, so 
they did need someone who could talk to other people and portray the Empire in a positive light. And the one guy who could do that was Kavat Kabanli. So I'm going to ignore what I wrote in my notes where I had him as a B or a C, and I'm actually going to go with an A. Um, so anyway, those are my rankings of the Ottoman generals World War I. You know, I, I created this list. You can find it. You can rank them yourself if you want to. All right. Okay. All right, I'm getting really tired. I guess we've gotten through all the Super Chats. Uh, Ayakob Unas, we've been talking about the Armenian Genocide literally the whole time. Because it happened in the middle of the war. Um, so, yeah. We have talked about that quite a bit. So, yeah. Um, anyway, those are my rankings for the Ottomans. As I mentioned, they were the hardest to rank because of just how difficult they are to gauge in many ways um, because their army kind of sucked, frankly, and most of their junior officers weren't that great either. So they had to be... I mean, you kind of grade on a curve. Now, in terms of the... Um, book giveaway. Zach Gilliam is the number one guy by a mile here. Number two is Digenes. And it looks like second place tonight, go, or third place, excuse me, goes to uh, a tie between Anthony Mason and Talon. So we'll actually do four prizes. So let's see, what else can we throw in here? Um, how about a historical novel? I just read one that's very good. The only thing wrong with it is that I spilled some coffee on it, but otherwise it's, you know, pretty good. That is Stephen Saylor's Wrath of the Furies. This is about the massacre. So again, this is related, and this massacre takes place in Asia, what's now Turkey. The massacre is of Mithridates by Mithridates VI of the Romans. So it's against that backdrop, and it follows a fictional character named Gordianus the Finder. And by the way, I recommend the whole series for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's called Roma Su Bruza. It's Rosa. It's about uh, basically a private investigator in the late Roman Republic. So that will be the other prize. So that's on the table. David Runciman's um, book on democracy is up, and. Um, the proof of the life and death of ancient cities is up, and also um, the book by Shelby Foote, Fort Donaldson to Shiloh. So, contact me with your preferences, each one of you who won, and assuming that the two people who finished tied for third do not have the same preferences, this will be easy to sort out. So put your preferences one to four. And I will work with what I have. And also, when you message me on Discord here, be sure to send me a message directly. So you'll get my personal messages. They pop up here. You see the list. Your message will pop up here. And then I'd be able to see your stuff privately. No one else will see it. And that would enable me to mail you your stuff. And yeah, that's it. So be sure to do that. And... You'll get your book, and I will be able to clear out some space, because I've got too many books right now, and I don't know what to do with some of the stuff i got. So it looks like uh, Gilliam wants the Runciman book. Cool. I can do that. Alright. But remember, Zach, be sure to send me your information on Discord so I can get your thing to the mail, in the mail for you. You can also send me an email... YouTube, if you look at my page, you'll be able to find my contact email, and you can also contact me there. So, all right. Well, that's all I have for you. Thank you all for joining me. I hope that uh, my voice didn't sound too rough tonight. It certainly feels a little rough. I don't know how it actually sounds, though, so I can't say. Uh, but thank you all for your patience. Uh, this one was a tough one to get through, not only because of lack of energy, but also just because uh, 
The research for this one was rather difficult just because there's not a hell of a lot in English. The future ones will be easier in terms of finding stuff, but they will be harder in terms of there being a lot more generals. So this World War I series will be quite a bit more challenging than most of the ones we've done in the past, but I've learned a ton doing this, and hey, you know, I, I had a good time. So I'll see you guys next week. I believe we'll be going back to the Three Kingdoms next week. At least that's what I'm intending to do at the moment. I will announce midweek what I'm actually planning to do. I'll think about it for a couple days. So be on the lookout, and I will let you know what we're going to be doing on Wednesday. So, uh, remember, the rest of March, we're also going to be doing a stream that involves Patrick Claiborne in some way. We're not sure the exact shape of it yet. And we will also be doing a... Um, What's the other one called? Uh, the one Sean wants to do. I forgot what he said, but we'll do that one too. Uh, on Franklin Pierce. There we go. So anyway, that is the plan for March. I will see you all around. Uh, and thank you for the donation, uh, Skullico3. Thank you for your dono. All right, so I got a bounce, but good night, everybody. I got, uh, I'm going to try to get some Zs. And I also got to update some stuff for my class. Somebody told me I sound like a Sardaukar throat singer. Uh, well, damn. Damn, damn, damn. Okay. All right, see you guys later. Peace out.